All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 10th, 2023, and man, we are in for a study tonight. I can tell you this, if you're a farmer that deals with wheat and grain and all sorts of things, well, this won't be anything new for you. But for all the rest of us, it is going to be a lesson like I had never learned before. I had struggled with something when it came to barley being in March, you know, in that late March, early April time that had bothered me for so long. And it was just always in the back of my mind. Well, after the last video, it really feel, it feels like it's been a week, two weeks since I've done the last video. Because as soon as the last video was done, things started coming into my thoughts and I started digging and searching. And man, I've done 20, 25 different Google searches, gone into dozens of websites, digging through all this stuff. And it finally makes sense. And when you see it, what the what needs to take place first in relation to how barley and wheat grows and and the differences of it and the portions of it and how it how, how this first part of barley comes in and and what it's called oh man i was so excited and i just kept digging and kept connecting all of these things together and i just thought man i can't wait to do the video and then i was building it and building it and now today we're finally here gave everybody the the usual allotment of time because as you guys know the videos are long and that's because this isn't just baby church lessons and going over everything over and over and over again this is the revelation this is the revelation channel the word the books have been revealed and they are opening and opening and opening and been happening for over five and a half years and today is no different. You're gonna see the book of Ruth with clarity greater probably than you ever have before. And you're gonna see things because of this conversation of barley and this conversation of wheat. You know, you've probably even heard a number of people lately, and I had a question asked of it as well uh, by our sister Trisha and others. You know, is it possible that the pre-trib group is barley? You know, and I'm not saying that it is, but we're going to go through some things and you're going to see a context that could be that maybe the pre-trib group going to the third heaven is the is the main harvest of the barley. OK, you're going to see that that's potentially possible. But only if it's going to happen this month. I see your text. Roy, it's too late. I'm already going. So what happens, as you're going to see as this develops, there's a possibility that the pre-trib group is the main barley harvest. Because you're going to understand something that I didn't understand before, and unless you've already understood it, that barley is also a winter planted grain like wheat. Now, you can also have spring barley and you can have spring wheat. How fitting, right? How fitting, just like Christ, right? So what do we know? There is a winter barley and there is a winter wheat. Both of these groups have that first fruits and the first fruits of, right? The feast of first fruits and the first fruits of the wheat, <clears throat> right? One of barley, one of wheat, of which Jesus says he is the first of the first fruits. So very fitting that they both have a late fall planted one, and you're going to see these things, unless you're a farmer, you're going to see these things like you never have before. Because for the longest time, I was struggling with how on earth barley could start sprouting in the beginning of spring. Like, what, you plant it and poof, in, in five days it starts sprouting? Like, it, it didn't make sense. Well, that's because there's a winter barley. And that is the barley that comes up early in spring. You're going to see how it lays out the meanings of it. Man, it's awesome. And what you're also going to understand is that there are only two options left of everything. Of everything. There's most likely the, the title of this video is something along the lines of Taurus, the beginning 
or the beginning. You see, what you're going to see is there, there's only two options for this year. Option one. Option one had with it either the 8th of Savan, the 15th of Savan, or the 25th of Savan. So the 8th to the 9th, the 15th to the 16th, or the 25th to the 26th, which is what we're looking at now. Excuse me. Those were the only three options or three possibilities within option one. So we know we have been Holy Spirit revealed in the physical this one thing that the revelation was of Taurus. That Taurus will begin it all. The question that always remained, does Taurus begin at all as in this is the escape and the 14 years be, uh, and the 50 days begin before the 14 years? For which, if this was the escape, what was the only reasoning for it? Well, that this is where it would be, but according to the Apocrypha and according to life, we know the moon is off. So according to the Apocrypha with Jubilees, the moon is off 10 days. We make the account. And what did it bring us to? After seven to the eighth day, and we know we've got scripture where the Lord himself uh, in Psalms is telling us in Psalms 19, the circuit of the sun, all connected to him as the typology of the sun in, the, in that situation. And so we also have Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 tells us in Luke chapter 21, right here, when it talks about the, the parable of the fig tree and all the trees. You see, when they now shoot forth, you see and know for your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. <clears throat> well, if summer is near at hand, it's got to be close to somewhere before summer starting, unless this, this, this uh, um, verse in this story of summer is simply... Uh, 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 like what, uh, 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 a story to, to show you, hey, just as you know this with summer, so will you know it with these things. Either it's just giving it as a story or it's giving us insight to say that it's going to be before summer. But we don't yet know with 100% certainty which one it means. We'll find out if everything starts here. You see, the other option is what we've spoken about with, um, with uh, uh, Zechariah chapter 7. And this is something we spoke about in the last video. In the last video, we talked about the in-depth and the revelation and how and why and the connections to getting to the week before summer and so forth. And I'm going to touch a little bit more and add a little bit more fun stuff to that that we're looking for over this next week. But I left you with saying that there was one more possibility because of something that I've been teaching on for probably close to five years. Close to five years now was this purpose of the fifth and seventh month from Zechariah 7. You see, so what I had recently believed was that the typology in the fifth and seventh month, we know is the revelation of the 50 days that comes first, which is in the first attack, right? In the north, a light affliction in northern Israel. And then, bang, 50 days ends, and the attack comes on Jerusalem, and they're scattered for the first seven years of seals. Now, we've taught on this, but the question was, is that, well, if it's going to start earlier, then that means the allegory or the typology of that story wasn't to actually tell us it's connected to the fifth and the seventh month, but it was the insight to show us that there was this 50 days that would start first. So the question is, just like Luke 21, is it that it's connected that it has to start before summer, right? To know that summer is near at hand? Or is it just an allegory or, or a storyline to say, just like you would know, summer is near when you see these things happening with the buddings. Is it just a story or is it actually telling us the season and time? Meaning it must begin before winter, uh, uh, before summer. And so that would mean 
that the fifth and seventh month are just a story that helped us get the understanding that the fifth and seventh month is the revelation of 50 days. And it's not that it has to be connected to the fifth and seventh month. You see, one of these two are true. One of these two are true. And the only way each of those two are true is if it begins in the month of Savan as Taurus. There are only two options. And the two options is it will begin sometime in the month of Taurus, the 50 days, the pre-trib escape will happen and the 50 days will start. Or it's that the count as Taurus being the beginning as it was in the beginning of creation, that Taurus was the beginning. And in the beginning, when it was Taurus, it meant 16th day of Taurus. And if that is the case, and the Lord God is still looking at Taurus as the first month, well, then we would be looking at the 16th of Savan as the typology to the resurrection day, just as Christ was in the beginning. It means the 16th day, the Feast of First Fruits, which is the 16th day, and it was in Taurus. And if that's the case, then we've got to do the one, two, three, four, five, uh, what was it, six, six, and then seventh sabbath and then this would be the beginning of the 50 days the ninth of av which would be july 27th this would be the beginning of the 50 days and look at that it lands on the ninth of av the ninth of av is the historical attack of the fifth month and when does 50 days end right here and what is it followed by the attack on the start of the year, the, the attack on the beginning, right at the start of Tishri 1, at the start of the Jews' new year. You see, what, the reason we can't get away from this is because we don't yet know with absolute certainty whether Taurus is the beginning or the beginning. You follow what I'm saying? So now what we need to do is we really need to dig into this and try to, to discern what is this? What, what is Taurus that the Lord, that the Spirit gave us right on target, bullseye Taurus? What is it? Is it going to be the beginning of the 50 days or is it a typology like in the beginning? That's, that's all that's left, guys. You see, and the first option, we looked from here, then to possibly here. And now we're looking to hear, and all three of them had biblical things that supported them. But there was still one more, and that is that Savan wasn't the be going to be the beginning of the 50, but that it was the beginning as it was in the beginning. That it represents month one to the Lord God, and this was the day of creation in the beginning, which means the Lord, which means the first fruits of the Feast of First Fruits was in Taurus, which is now Savan, and it was the 16th day. If that's the case, then we've got to do the count like we would Resurrection Day, and then do the seven Sabbaths, and then 50 days. I want you guys to know something. This is it. This is all we have left. I want this to really, really sink in for you guys. This is all we have left. And you're going to understand how this count here is also connected. We taught on it many times, and I was leading you into it in the last video. I had set it aside for a bit because it looked like these other things were the connection. Yet we have like five or six different books telling us of this one story right here from the ninth of Av to the first of Tishri. Why would one story in scripture that was about a, a month and a half or so long be so widely spoken about in scripture? From Kings to Second Chronicles 
to Daniel, to Jeremiah, to Ezra. It's all over the place. Except what was shall be, what is shall be. But then how do we get to these? How on earth can it possibly still be here? And how on earth is it possible that it would take us to the ninth of Av and then 50 days? How is that one even potentially possible? Well, that's what we're going to see today. That's what you're going to see because it's all in the harvests. It's all in the harvests. Man, it is so awesome. It is so exciting. I want you guys to know this as well. We know this chart here very well, right? We have broken down. This is our Sabbath Shemitah year chart that goes all the way from the birth of Christ. From the birth of Christ. And we did the Sabbath year counts every seventh Sabbath all the way through. We understood Luke chapter three when Jesus began to be about 30 and what it means. It doesn't mean he turned 30 and then it was gone. It means he completed 29 and he was just starting his 30th year. It revealed the revelation through the end of days, how it equaled this time, how it brought us to here and showed when they came into the land in 1948, that from 1948 to 1949, it was still just the set up year. It wasn't yet the beginning of the count. You're gonna to wanna to remember this because we're gonna get back to this as we go further into this tonight. Because if you remember, there's the house of Israel count and there's the house of Judah count. Something that we've taught on and learned years ago, or I mean over the last few years, and that was what's called accession and non-accession, which is the differences in the counts of the kings in the Bible and how when a, a, an Israel king came into the land from the house of Israel, then no matter where it started in the year, when Nisan 1 came, they would say that's the start of their second year. So even if they came in in January or February and they only ruled for two months and then Nisan 1 comes, they would have called those two months or however long it was before, they would have called that the first year. And when you get to Nisan 1, they would say, now that starts your second year. But with the house of Judah, they didn't. They, the, the house of Judah king could have came in and say February or so and would have six, seven months, whatever it is, to get to Tishri. And when they get to Tishri, they didn't say, ah, year two is now starting. They would say, that's all part of your accession. That's just your preparation time. And then at Tishri one, bang, now the count begins. Aha, aha. That's something you're gonna to wanna to remember because now you're gonna to start to see, you're gonna to start to realize there's this an alignment that still takes us to what? Tishri one. How can it still take us to Tishri one? Because it's not the house, there's no kings of the house of Israel in the land of Israel right now. They're the kings of the house of Judah. Israel is scattered throughout the world. The Gentiles are grafted in with them. The only ones that are there are the house of Judah. So you're going to see how this is possible and directly connected that it's something that if this summer solstice comes and goes and still we're here and nothing's changed, well, hold on tight because the story ain't over yet. Okay, we've, we've broken this down and how to do the count of Leviticus 19. So much so that I have declared we have understood it. And there aren't many things that I make an absolute declaration of like we do with the Gospels, with the revelation of the 14 years, the big picture, there are certain things that we know with 100% certainty are declared and understood. Well, do you know what that means? That means if that was really year one, whether it was at the Lord God's time or Tishri time, that means this is the end of the 70th year of Israel. Do you want to hear the bad news? Do you want to hear the bad news? I'm going to tell you what the bad news is. I was talking with Micah on the phone from uh, Interrupts 165 the other day. You want to know what the bad news is? If it doesn't happen this year, if it doesn't happen this year, you want to know what the bad news is? Then the 70 meant to Jerusalem. What? 
Are you telling me, Alan, that if it doesn't happen at some point this year before the fall feast, it has to happen? That if it doesn't happen, it can't be next year. There is no 70. You see, we're the only ministry on earth that I know of that has tracked and followed the 70 years. I don't know one. We've got people all over the world and countries everywhere, and nobody has heard in their languages or anything. Nobody's still tracking the 70th year. We've tracked it and we've understood it. So much so that it turns out the 70 of Jerusalem is exactly 14 years after the true 70 of Israel. How about that? You see, is there anybody listening that for a moment believes it's possible we've got 14 more years to go before the 14 years of tribulation begins? It's, I know it's rhetorical. This isn't a live show, right? But do you think with everything going on, with all of this transgender stuff and all of this agenda, with what BlackRock and, and those companies own, do you guys know that the entire agenda of all of these things that are happening and why the bud and all these commercials and all, I mean, all these corporations are doing this, why all these countries keep pushing it and will imprison people for speaking against them and everything else, the transgender and everything else? Because through BlackRock and the World Economic Forum, guys, go look it up. It's incredible to understand. This is why, even in the midst of plummeting sales, they're still going to stick to their guns and more will continue to do it and nations will continue to do it. It's because it's like a, an EGS or ESG score or something like that through the World Economic Forum that holds nations and corporations accountable that their scores will drop or will be raised up based on them reaching certain laid out goals that the World Economic Forum has put forward. And the transgender, the, the, the uh, uh, currency, all of these things are connected to that score. And if they don't abide by that and their scores lower, it's just like China's scoring system for the, for the citizens. If they're not obedient, their score drops and everybody knows. Well, they've, they're doing it right now. It's been going on for a few years now with nations and these major corporations. That is why this push has been happening. And it won't stop until the Lord brings about his time. You have to understand that. It's all through the economic form and these major ones that hold. Why do you think BlackRock went in and took major stakes in all of these huge corporations so that they can bring about the control over them? You see, I don't even know that all of these big corporations want to do it. They want profits. But if they don't abide by this, their scores drop. They won't get the media attention. They'll get negative coverage. You see? It's incredible, guys. Do you think for a moment that that's going to go on for another 14, 15 years before tribulation starts? Do you think that that the, the digital currency and everything that's already being brought into nations and being used in other places is, is going to settle and take 14 more years? Do you think that China is going to settle down and America is going to settle down and for the next 14 years they're going to kumbaya until it all starts? You think Russia and everything going on and, and everything that's taking place in Ukraine, all that's, you think all of that's going to settle down and we've got another 14 years? Iran's got the, these missiles and everything else give it, being given and everything going on over there and that's just going to settle and go on for another 14 years? Heck no. So do you know what it means? It goes back to only our two options. It's either going to be this year or it's going to be in 14 years. If you believe it's going to be in 14 years, good luck to you. Brothers and sisters, this is the only year that remains. We're in the midst of it. And the answer to it is Taurus begins it or Taurus begins it. That's all that's left. That's all that's left, guys. How about that for my opening gamut? <laughs> <laughs> I got a little bit heated because I'm excited on this one, man. When you understand these things, you realize there's only two left. There's only two options. 
Oh, I don't want to go to late July. Join the club. Do you know why you don't want to go to late July? I don't want to either. I'm not saying it's there, but you will understand here tonight how that is our final possibilities. And it's not because we want to go. We want it today. We want it right now, right? Why? Because as the first fruits, we yearn within ourselves like the earth is yearning. We just want to go and be with the Lord. We don't want the death and destruction and everything that comes with it to fall upon loved ones and family and friends and people all over the world. That's not why we want it. That's the last thing we want. But you know what we want more than family and friends and loved ones and everything else? We want the Lord. We just want the Lord. You know, it's like Mike said, he had said in the past, look, I don't care if it starts. If I have to work, and what he meant by that is, I, I don't care if I'm a worker. I don't care if I even have to work through the entire 14 years and the pit is going to open and everything else and I'm here. I will just be so relieved knowing that we have understood and that we're literally in this time. When you know beyond all knowing because it has now been made known and you're chosen and you're a worker, remnant bride, and that, you know what? Hallelujah, glory to God. Because you will know what it means. You see? You will know what it means. There's no worrying about the rest of your life. There's no worrying about this or that or the other thing. It's the end. And this is where we're at. It's here somewhere. And in these somewheres connected to Taurus, there were only two left. The first option had three choices. The second one, it appears to only have one. And why does it have one? Because we were given the fifth and the seventh. The question has always been, how can it get to the fifth and the seventh within the understanding of harvests? How can you get to the 5th and the 7th when, when barley is in March or, or early April? How on earth can you get from there barley and, and the, the, the same winter wheat that was planted? You got to wait till, till the 9th of August. You got to wait till the time of the 5th month. How, how on earth does that even compute? You're going to see. You're going to see it for yourself. It's awesome. For anybody that's new to the ministry, I'm going to do this real quick. If you're new to the ministry and you're hearing things like 14 years and you're hearing things like who the Gospels are speaking to, these are the core of the revelations that have been revealed here in this ministry. And you're going to want to come to this playlist right here, link the playlist tab on the YouTube channel and come to this right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. You can watch the videos, the first four videos in there and, the, and, and begin to understand these things for yourself. You're going to see the first video is a simple 22-minute video, and you can go to the ministryrevealed.com website. Here's the homepage. You can download the book for free in five different languages. You can download it in audio English. You can read it from the website itself, from the book page, or if you want a paperback or ebook, you can go to Amazon. In it, you'll find all the things that we talk about, all the things that are, that are in these intro videos and so forth, but you can also come right here. Just like you saw on the YouTube page, you can come to this intro page and start with this 22-minute video that is going to explain to you briefly this 30-minute end-time Bible study of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to that then reveals to you that the end of days isn't just seven years, but two sets of seven, which is Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse, and there is a 50-day period of time that begins it all before the 14 years, and that is related to Luke's group. And it will also briefly touch on this third video, which is a big one, about two hours and 45 minutes, that it's all because of Matthew. You're going to see that the reason everybody thinks the whole world was only 7,000 years by the time it's done that they think the tribulation is only seven years is because everybody's eyes were fixed and, and, and focused on everything founded in the Gospel of Matthew because it was never understood Mark and Luke's purpose. 
The synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew are the revelation of pre, mid, and post. And it is going to blow your mind. All you need to do just to get your, your lips wet is listen to this 22 minute intro video. And from there, listen to these next three. And if it doesn't drop your jaw, if you don't say, oh my goodness, this has begun to answer questions that I have wondered about in my Bible studies for years, then go do something else. Go back to your Bible studies, go to your seven year church. Don't worry about it. Don't stop watching. Don't stop praying because the time is at hand. But I promise you, this is going to be worth every moment that you spend in it. And you're going to realize for yourself these answers to questions that I am sure if you've ever studied the Bible, you have had and that your church has never been able to answer. They always tell you it's just perspective within the Gospels. They have never been able to understand it in these differences within the Gospels that have confused people for centuries. Then you can go deeper. Then you can see the greater detail. This is a three hour video of that first 30 minute Bible study in the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to. It goes much deeper. This is the discourses revealed, the story that will be Matthew in the end will be Luke that starts it. So Matthew's first, but in the end, Luke will be first. The last will be first, the first will be last. You're gonna see the discourses revealed like you've never seen before. You're gonna understand pre, mid, and post are all true, and that's why there's arguments and debates over it. You're gonna see the book of Revelation from chapter six to chapter 14 revealed before your eyes in this video. It's absolutely incredible. But don't come and start here because you'll never understand how this came to be without first understanding those intro videos. Ever wonder how the seven churches play out in the end of days? Wonder no more. It's here revealed as well, okay? There's this great mystery of why a comma and is so important. It's gonna blow you away. And then we've got one that goes deep, which is what we call the open books. We've got like 14 different books, the gospels, that all reveal end times events within their chapters that line up with the years of the end of days. And then this big one that just blows our minds that you're gonna see that the whole story is a fractal. From the beginning of creation to the end is 21,000 years. Sounds crazy, right? It's 21,000 years and the 22nd thousand year will be the new heaven and the new earth. It, it'll be the beginning of everything again. It's gonna blow your mind because what you're gonna realize is it's the picture of the end of days. It's seven easy years that are coming to an end right now, like Jacob worked, they felt like days, right? Because he was so in love. Then he worked another seven years to complete it for Rachel. And then he worked another six years for the cattle. Wait till you see what I show you about the cattle, man. It's going to freak you out. When, he, when it's the final six years for the cattle, that's the six years of trumpets. And then what does he do? He makes a covenant, right? Uh, uh, Jacob makes a covenant with his father-in-law Laban after 20 years. It's the seven easy, the seven of seals, the six of trumpets. And when that 13th year, when that 20th year is done, it is a covenant just like Daniel 9, 27. The Lord returns feet down, renews the covenant that he will have made at the beginning of trumpets, at the end of seals, beginning of trumpets. He will renew, he will destroy the enemy, bind Satan for a thousand years. And when that final 21st or 14 years of seals and trumpets is done, it'll be the millennial reign and everybody, uh, it'll be the, the, the final jubilee, the 22nd year. They'll all return, they'll be established, and it'll be the start of the millennial reign, which is the final thousand of the 21,000. And when it's over, just like the eighth day, just like the eighth year, the eighth millennium in the final seven will be just as the 22nd, and it will be eternity. That's how crazy wild this entire revelation goes. We take it all the way back to the beginning of creation. <laughs> Man, it is so... You see, when I ponder these things sometimes, it, I, oh, it's crazy. It is so unbelievable. So here we are in this ministry that's been revealed all of these things. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of revelations of mysteries and, and answers to questions that people have had for hundreds of years, but it goes even deeper. 
it goes even deeper because when you get the answer and you find this revelation, you realize the other things that connect to it. And they were questions that people never even yet had. Never even yet had because we didn't even know to ask them because we didn't yet know the revelation that unlocked the other piece. That's how deep we're talking about. And it all begins with that intro series, either here from YouTube or by going to the website. So awesome. I wanted to share with you guys as well, our sister, uh, Trisha, and our other sister, actually. Oh, where's she from? Uh, Portugal, I think, with uh, Karina Lehman and Trisha X-Men. She's our sister down in the US. Uh, she's the writer. K Karina is the illustrator. And this is their second book just released here in the last like day or two um i think it's been a couple of days maybe three days because i just ordered mine uh two days ago and i just got it today so trisha i just got my book today they're awesome she's actually they they've entered it uh, i think both their books one of the books both the books i'm not sure are entered into an amazon competition and uh getting getting a, a um a, what is it editors or you know to to help get the book out there incredible incredible books great stories man if anybody gets a chance come and get it this is the u.s website uh, i got it in canada so i'm, I'm a dot ca so uh, uh you know whatever country you're in i'm sure they'll have it or in most countries get it man it's awesome all right so i wanted to share that with you guys as well oh now i want to share with you guys another story this is an exciting one this is something that we have been trying to discern here for a while. You see, it's the story of the stone's throw. And the stone's throw, again, <laughs> again, has something that we've talked about having what? Two possibilities. Now, what do I mean by two possibilities? Well, for example, if this is the 10 days later, right? The difference of the moon. So this is where we're looking at this would be the seventh Sabbath, and this would be the beginning of 50 days, then we were looking that the stone's throw that we know is coming at the beginning, at or near the beginning. You see, I still say at or near the beginning. I believe we can say at the beginning now, all right? You're going to start to, you'll, you'll understand in a moment why I'm saying that. But it has always been a question since I've understood that the stone's throw was coming first, that would the bride see the stone's throw? Would we all, would the entire world see the stone's throw coming, but be gone before it actually hits? Okay. And for the longest time, I've leaned more to that. But when we read it in, in another piece of context, it sometimes seems that it's going to be in the midst of the wedding week, the seven day wedding that's going to start. So it'll be the escape. And when the 50 days start, it starts with the seven day wedding and the Lord returns on the eighth day as the son of man for 40 days. You know the whole story. So the question has been, are we going to see the stones throw coming? And before it hits, we're going to be gone. Or does the stones throw come at some point? in the midst of it and lands in that week as well. Well, there's nothing that says we can't foresee it, but it may not hit until a little further in the week, right? So the question is, are we gonna see it or are we not gonna see it and it's gonna be something that happens in the midst of the week, okay? Well, you guys know of a dream that I had. I've had really, I think just this one dream out of all, you guys know I don't have visions, I don't get audibles, I have the revelation of understanding. And <laughs> you're gonna see that exploited here again tonight. But what happened in that dream, and it was very early on, it was late September of 2017, and all this knowingly began to start with me September 8th of 2017. And it was late September into October, and I had had this dream, and I told you, I, I, it was, I, it's still, I can still picture it today. I did a video about it, I, I was watching other uh, just YouTube videos going through YouTube and I saw a thumbnail of a small image 
of what was being shown as these different little meteor marbles and these other ones maybe the size of baseballs and that was exactly what i saw but on a much bigger scale coming in from the sky that there was like two one real big one and maybe one or two other medium sized ones like maybe like an apartment building and then the other ones maybe like buses or so forth and then there were some smaller ones around it and i saw them coming from my upper left down to my right and they were breaking through the sky and it looked from where I was, I was like up on a hill and it looked like there was a bridge over there and they were heading towards the water and everybody was running and, and I told the story, I ran into an apartment building and I was with my wife and we were running, I never saw it hit, but as we were running up the stairs, um, we went to look out a window and my wife wasn't with me anymore. I was, then I started looking for her. I'm now believing that what happened, and you're gonna understand why I'm saying this, it had never dawned on me before until my brother, or one of our brothers, shared his daughter's dream with me that she had on Thursday. She's nine years old. Never had a, a, a rapture dream before. His wife has, and we'll, I'll share briefly on that as well. And it's our brother Jake and his daughter uh, Melody. But what happened now, it starts to make sense with me that probably what happened is the reason why now my wife wasn't there and it was probably because at that point then they were about to hit but you see i was still there it may now make sense to me that the reason my wife wasn't there and that i'm here is because i'm probably as many would have would have already assumed gonna remain as that remnant worker bride right that that priscilla and aquila portion doesn't mean my wife necessarily has to be here right Maybe my job is different than the Aquila Priscilla, but uh, a leading portion in it. You know what I'm saying? And the reason I bring this up is because our brother Jake had told me the, the story, uh, the dream that his daughter had, nine years old. And he, it was so awesome because she was so excited when it happened. She told the story. It was vivid. She remembered it, told it to her dad. And Jake had never told the story of the stone throw to his kids before. So she doesn't know about the stone's throw and, and what we teach about the stone's throw coming first, right? Or in the midst of the week. Well, here it was sounding similar, not the same, but similar to mine in the sense that she had this, she saw a meteor coming through. This huge meteor was coming and it was going to hit the earth. And right before it hit the earth, bang, she was taken and she was in heaven. And she was telling her dad and she was so excited by it. And Jake was like, man. I know exactly what that is. That's Luke chapter 21. That's John chapter 8. You know, we can understand these things. You see, and so she was really excited. But to me, it was also what? Well, that strikes me that if we use this one as the beginning of the 50 days, this is the seven-day wedding, this is the eighth day, okay? Whether it starts here or whether it's the end of July, the same principle applies. It would appear, knowing that the bride escapes right here at the beginning right before the 50 days or at the time of the 50 days starting, that if she saw it, then that would mean we would see the stone's throw coming first. That would be our sign. Could you imagine that freak out? <laughs> right? That'll be a bit of a freak out. But guess what? It was one of the two options that we have understood about the stone's throw for a long time. He also told me a story that uh, his wife has very vivid dreams. And he had said in one of them, the rapture had happened. Um, she was in heaven. She saw how beautiful it was. The family was there. But he, she said that her husband, Jake, wasn't. And he says for, for a long time, it had really bothered him because he hadn't yet found ministry revealed. So he was very confused. He couldn't understand why were they all in heaven and, and he was left behind. You see? Then he finds the ministry, I don't know, about a year, year and a half, two years ago, maybe something like that. And guess what? Now it makes sense, doesn't it? His family was taken. They didn't see him in heaven because he was left for what? Part of the remnant worker bride. You see that? So there are dreams. There are visions. There are people with prophetic and, and understanding. But man, discernment is necessary. <laughs> and it's not always easy. You see, let's let's have a, a quick discussion on what we've talked about here with this, with Luke chapter 21, right? 
let's let's briefly go into this and see how it can also be before but the landing happens after the escape this is the part that we've tried to to understand where it was for a while in luke 21 25 through 28 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring okay what is this sign in the signs in the sun the moon and the stars well this is something we've taught on right what are the signs in the sun moon and stars right here revelation chapter 12 verse 1 the actual revelation chapter 12 uh, verse 1 is going to be something that is going to be physically seen in an oh my goodness way that's the real revelation 12 1 okay with the sun the moon and the stars and for years i'd been saying that the escape is going to be between the end of verse 1 and the start of verse 2. Why? Because the travailing in birth represents the 40 days of the Son of Man and the pain to be delivered. This word pain represents the first two and a half years of seals. We've broken all this down. We've got a, one of the more recent Revelation 12 videos that we did that breaks down the entirety of the overview picture of tribulation in Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> so, even in the past, I was saying that we would see this first and the escape would happen before verse 2 starts. Okay? What is this sign in the sun, moon, and stars? It's Luke's discourse, that portion of Luke's discourse, 25 through 28. So, this right here. Well, what else do we know is connected to the sea? We see signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon, and upon the earth, uh, distress of nations with perplexity. Well, this word perplexity, a state of quandary, it's used only one time. But can we get more definition from it? Of course we can. It's from the same as 639. What is 639? Look at this. To have no way out. Hello. Hello. The nations at this point will be perplexed having no way out. Which means somewhere upon seeing this, the escape must have happened. Because all the distress of nations that follow are with a perplexity. And guess what? They have no way out of it. You see, now listen to what happens. Men's hearts uh, failing for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and when they shall see the, uh, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, when do they begin to come to pass? Right here. Right here. And there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Revelation 12, 1. So, at the start of seeing these signs in the sun, moon, and stars, it says what? And when these things begin to come to pass, that's the beginning, okay? That's the beginning of these things. 12.1 is the beginning of these things starting to come to pass. And when these things begin to come to pass, then what? Then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. The question in this in the past had always been, well, is this, is this really at the end of the seven days when he comes on the eighth day and it's really talking to the disciple workers? No, I don't think so anymore. And when I talked on this in a, in a recent video, again, it only had two options as well. It was either relating to the beginning at the escape or it was relating to when he comes at the eighth day. I spoke on this as to how it's the Son of Man maybe being the eighth day because when you go to the transfiguration right for luke's it's at the eighth day when you go to mark and matthew after six days after six days it's after six years and after six years of seals and trumpets in both cases it's just like mark's discourse and matthew's discourse when the lord's coming one at the end of the six years of seals one at the six at the end of the six year of trumpets so would this be the same or is it 
that because essentially it goes in reverse, meaning this is happening first, that this is actually the redemption of lifting up your heads for your redemption draws nigh is actually the pre-trip. And you see, we, we have the context. When these things begin, when these things begin to come to pass, well, where do they begin? At the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. What was her dream? What was my dream? Seeing this and everything, ah, bam, the escape happens. Lift up your heads. You see, we have a connection to it. Well, let me show you the other piece of the connection that I think will help us out even more. Again, something we've taught on numerous times. We know the revelation in, in the prophetic understanding of 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8. All right? He meets with Matthew's group, the 12. He meets with the larger group, which is the Mark group. And then after that, he meets with the apostles. Okay, that's the John group. And then last of all, it's Paul saying, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. This represents the Luke group. Okay, and what is one born out of due time? It's Isaiah 66, 7, right? Before she travailed, she brought forth, right? So even before the travailing. So just like in Revelation chapter 12, 1, uh, verse 2 starts, and then she, when she started to travail, that means before she travailed. What does that mean? It means one born out of due time. It means, it means one born uh, uh, premature. Okay, before the travailing begins. Well, what does this represent? It represents Luke's, that's pre. You see, oftentimes what happens is we talk about the two as that represent the witnesses, not, not the two witnesses, but the two on the road to Emmaus who are that remnant worker bride portion during seals. And when we talk about them, we, we talk about it directly related in the context of Luke 24. However, there's a beginning of Luke 24. And that beginning of Luke 24 is directly related to one born out of due time, is directly related to Isaiah 66, 7, before she travailed, is directly related to Revelation chapter 12, 1, right before verse 2, then goes into, and then she travailed. All of these things are before the travailing begins. Okay? What is the travailing? The travailing are the 40 days of the Son of Man starting. When do the 40 days of the Son of Man start? They start down here. Okay? Yes, on the eighth day for the apostles, but then he comes to who? Then he comes to the two on the road to Emmaus. This is the eighth day. Okay? This is the exact typology. We've taught on it many times. This is the typology of the Priscilla's, the Aquila's, the remnant bride workers. Okay? This is the eighth day. He meets with them. He's going to eat with them and serve them. But, do you remember this part? We haven't spoken about it in a while, right? In Luke chapter 24, verse 3. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Who's his body? His bride. Only Luke's resurrection story has the body of the Lord Jesus that wasn't there. Only in Luke's. You see, when you understand, if you're newer, once you understand the differences in the Gospels, you're going to understand these little pieces of insight like this. Why is this word here? Why is that word not there? Why is this story so much different here than it is over there? Because it's prophecy built into the Gospels. Okay, so what do we see? The body. This, this is the pre-trib escape. This is the pre-trib escape right here. So then guess what? If that's the pre-trib escape, and we read verse 4, and it says, and it came to pass they were much, well, look at that. They were much perplexed to have no way out, right? Well, what if we go to perplexed? It's not the same one, right? To be thoroughly unplaused, to be much perplexed, but oh my goodness, look at the word it comes from. To have no way out. <laughs> you see, this is a picture of the pre-trib bride, gone. Then you have your seven-day wedding, and it relates to John, 
and, and the apostles. He returns on the eighth day. He meets with the apostles. But then it doesn't go to this story. It goes to the two on the road to Emmaus, the ones that represent the remnant worker bride who we will dine with and so forth. The story of that eighth day starts here. This story is the story of the pre-trib escape. This is why in 1 Corinthians 15 at 8, we see that it went from 7, it was John's apostles, and then it goes to the Luke conversation. Those being born prematurely. Because it's the Luke group, right? That's why for anybody that's new, Luke was arrayed in, in, in Luke's gospel at the going to the cross. Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, it was purple. In Matthew, it was scarlet. A bride is in white. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. Luke is the representation of that pre-trib Gentile Ruth bride. So why am I bringing this up? Because if this is the representation right here, the body's gone and they're perplexed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds, sounds very similar. And we see right here, that what? Signs in the sun, moon, and stars. So when these things begin to come to pass, right? Lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. And what happens? The world is now perplexed, having no way out. Do you guys remember this one? We even have it in 2nd Ezra's, right? 2nd Ezra's chapter 13, starting verse 29. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. And what does it say? And bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. And they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, kingdom against kingdom. This is the red horse rider right here. That happens 50 days later. What starts it? The pre-trib escape. And then what are they going to be? Bewildered. Well, what does bewildered have to do with anything? Well, anybody that's been around for a bit, you'll remember this. What's another word for bewilderment? What's synonymous with bewilderment? Perplexity. To be, in be, to be bewildered or to be perplexed is the same thing. It just means the same thing. And here they are. The signs, we would see it. It's coming through. Distress of nations with perplexity. So escape. See, sun, moon, stars, things happening, bang, escape happens, and then the nations in, the, in uh, distress, in perplexity. Men's hearts will then fail them and so forth. You see, but when it starts, they're gone. You following? When we line this up with all of these other parts that we've lined up, including going to 1 Corinthians, going to... Uh, uh, Revelation 12, going to Isaiah. All of this leads me to believe that whether it be here or whether it be here, we will see the stone's throw coming. I believe I am way more heavily leaning, way more, like 90-10, that we are going to see the beginnings of this stone's throw coming through. We will see it. Remember this, guys? How about this one? A Netflix movie with a huge lineup of stars. We talked about it last year. And there was, there was some pretty wild connections to it last year because the 15th of Savan was, I think, the 14th of June. So it seemed pretty interesting, right? Well, what's, what's the interest this year? When we account for the 10 days difference from the 4th to the 14th, we're at the 14th of June. So the sixth month, 14th day. So this is just a little add-on, right? This is, we know that movies hide things and put things out there all the time, okay? There, there have been so many, but sometimes what it is is it's just when you have eyes that could see, ears that could hear, and a heart that can receive, what happens is we can see it in all sorts of things. You know, I often think of our brother Ed or Brian, you know, that, that 
with the, the Suez Canal and these ships and these, you know, the, the ability to see the typologies of events that were biblical played out. But does it mean that it really is connected to the end of days, that everything's going to start? It could seem like that sometimes, right? Sometimes it could really seem like that, but what it really is in being able to see it in movies and videos and, and marketing and all sorts of things is that you have eyes to see. The enemy is, is putting things out. It's being able to see these things. And sometimes the Lord is doing things as well. So what is it in this case? Well, this is one heck of an all-star cast for a Netflix movie that didn't even go to theaters, isn't it? This movie, Don't Look Up, and this is why I'm bringing it up. Because, yes, we've spoken on it last year, but why is it so, why, why do I feel it's got a connection? Because it's absolutely mocking Luke 21, verse 28. You see, when these things begin to come to pass, which are these things coming when this, in this, these signs in the sun, moon, and stars, when this meteor comes, See, men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming on the earth. It's a meteor coming and breaking up whatever size, however impactful, it's going to be a big deal. Of course, it's right here in Luke's discourse. So it's going to be a big deal. And it says, then look up and lift up your heads. This is a mockery telling you, don't look up. Like they're making a joke of it, right? Don't look up. Well, what was the big deal with this movie? It came out December 5th, 2021. And the movie was about when they discovered this meteor coming, they said from the discovery that there was six months and 14 days before it hits. Pretty interesting, right? I think that's interesting because June 14th, is the six month 14th day. But do you know that six months and 14 days from December 5th is June 19th? Is June 19th. When, when are we looking for things to begin for this last, this last possibility of the three in the first option? Right here, 614, but six months and 14 days actually equals June 19th. What is it? In the midst of the week. So is it possible, as we've been saying, it's going to be seen, the bride vanishes, and then what? It's going to hit on June 19th? Pretty interesting when you consider the dream, right? Starts to make more sense with mine that I had. It certainly is in alignment with, with uh, melodies. and. If this is the week, then we were given insight through something the enemy already knows that's on its way. So again, am I saying this is it because of this movie? No. I'm saying look at the coincidental connection to this third watch in this first option. You get it? It is something else that just has me say, whoa, what are the chances? What are the chances in the revelation of what we've shown in this 50-day connection? Knowing what will happen, what will happen within the first week, wherever those 50 days will begin, during that wedding week, what will happen is exactly related to what happened to Ephesus, the revelation of the end of days, the typology of the first seven days when Ephesus came to be because a meteor struck and they created the goddess Diana in Ephesus because of a meteor and Ephesus starts the 50 days. You following? Not, not pretend stuff, not, not just whimsical movie stuff, but stuff that we can line up with scripture. The question is, is it going to be lined up and the movie was really helping us get insight and we're going to see this coming, but the hit won't be until the midst of the week? 
Interesting stuff, right? Well, let's not forget. In Luke 22, where the revelation comes from, watch this. In Luke chapter 22, where we have the revelation in chapter, uh, verse 41, I think. You see, and he was drawn from them about a stone's cast. So he's about a stone's throw away. We know that this is, this is only found in Luke 22, and it's only in Luke's gospel. No other gospel do we get this little blurp of a wording that he's a stone's throw away. What would be the point of him saying he's a stone's throw away? He didn't have to say it in Matthew. He didn't have to say it in Mark. He didn't say it anywhere else. Why did he say it here? Because it was the insight to understand connected in Luke 21. He's a stone's throw away. Well, when was this? This would be related to the 14th day, right? This just as they had finished their Passover meal and he's going to be taken at some point on the 14th day, right before, uh, I guess it's late on the 13th going into the 14th for his crucifixion. So what would that equal? Well, if this is supposed to be the 15th, right? That would be your 15th of Savan, 10 days for the moon. That would make this the 15th of Savan and the seventh Sabbath, okay? And then this would begin your 50 days. That would mean that this would be the 14th, okay? 10 days difference, okay? So could it be the stone's throw is gonna be seen here? You see, it's gonna be seen, there's gonna be reports, they're gonna maybe lie and there's gonna be not too much panic at first. And then it's gonna be seen a bit more. The bride escapes, these events of the sun, moon and stars are taking place. You see why I'm saying that? Because if 10 days off is here and 10 days off is here, well, this would be the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Do you remember the 14th, 15th, and 16th? It's the head of Taurus, guys. Remember that? It's the head of Taurus. This represents 70, which is Ayin. This represents the 14th brightest star, which is noon, the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the 15th represents just Taurus as a whole which is Christ at his birth. Hello. It's the head of Taurus. So would we be looking at the 14th, 15th, and 16th? Meaning this would be like the 14th, seeing the stone's throw coming, saying that he's a stone's throw away. And that takes us to what? The beginning now connected to the typology at his resurrection. The body is gone, and then they're perplexed, which would be what? The 16th, early in the morning. This is the escape, and that's why they would see him coming. Their redemption draws nigh, because it relates to what? The 14th, 15th, 16th, as it would have like this, but we're accounting for the moon. Guys. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. We are not out of the water here. We are still in this. I'm talking to you from June 10th. We may see something by Tuesday. Tuesday night or something. This is our window right here. Tuesday to Thursday in the next few days. Can we maybe say, well, what if we extend it a little bit more and just see if nothing's happened? Maybe we'll look to uh, uh, the solstice. Sure. But after this, then it only leaves one final option, guys. It will only leave one option. Now, let me start leading you into this. Let me really now, we've seen that, we've seen that there's still these connections and, and a number of them, and now adding a little bit more to the mix with this connection. But we've got something else going on here, right? I'm going to start by showing you the end of this story to bring you the understanding of the fifth and seventh month and how that is still their 70 years in Israel and yet the count still beginning in Taurus, okay? We know that Pentecost is... One, a 50-day count after 
the seventh Sabbath. Not maybe, not kind of, we 100% know it. It's revealed, it's understood, and the revelation of the end of days has proven it out. The other piece is we know that it is connected to new wine. They were accused of being drunk on new wine. Okay? They were accused of being drunk on new wine. This is the clue. They were full of new wine. You see? Only used one time, though. So we've got to be able to discern these things. Look what else it says. <laughs> Acts 2.17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. See that? In the end of days. See? This is the stuff that's coming again. Okay? But what is this talking about? What is Pentecost? Pentecost is the season of new wine. It is 50 days after the seven Sabbath count. Got it? Good. <laughs> All right. It, it's, it's not maybe, it's not kind of. It is new wine. And it's 50 days after the Feast of Weeks count. You want to know something about new wine? This has got to, th this has to have you scratching your head. It's going to have to. You're going to say, oh, Alan, I've been here long enough. I've seen you teach on this before and the timing of this. Well, you have, but you're never, you will have never seen it to this level of depth before. Because the question is going to have to come, uh... How can you get to that count from Passover? How on earth can you get to new wine with a feast of weeks and a 50-day count and get to Passover? It doesn't make any sense. Watch this. You see, if this here is Resurrection Day, which it is, it's the Feast of First Fruits. See, first month, 16th day. Christ's resurrection, right? It's called what? The beginning. You see? When you go to creation in the beginning, it was the 16th day of the first month, but it was in Taurus because that's where the sun was at the time. You see? 16th day, first month, 16th day, first month as Taurus. But because the sun has moved, it's here now. Okay? Wait till you see these things. So if this is it, and you do your seven Sabbaths count. One Sabbath, two, three, okay? Because it's the eighth, 15th, 22nd, 29th day. So you've got first Sabbath, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, okay? There's your seven count. And then this is why we were looking for the 50 days to begin here. If the 50 days began there, where did it bring you? Uh, shoot, I don't remember where it brought us anymore. Oh, it brought us to July 17th. Okay? July 17th is where it brought us. Well, when you realize something about wine, you're going to say, um, how is that possible? How is that possible? You want to know what's even crazier? Is the world will have told you that this was Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, right? Because they mix it together. And the church would have said, this was Pentecost, right? Because they'll do it on the Sunday. This was your Easter. Does anybody on earth have their grapes ready for harvest and making new wine at the end of May? <laughs> It's absolute lunacy and absurdity. It's not even close. It's not even kind of. There is no such thing as new wine. And I've said this before. Do you think all the churches are deceived in, in that some of these pastors don't really know this? They must. There must be some pastors that are fully aware that new wine isn't ready in the end of May. 
Not even a little bit. Not even a possibility. So that alone, by going to Acts chapter 2, gives you insight to say, okay, well, you know, it's, it's Shavuot, which we know. We've now done the count. We do the extra 50 days. And it brought us to the 23rd of July. Uh, uh, the 17th, sorry, of July. Well, that's like in the midst of summer. That's like barely a month into summer. The grapes are really just starting to get going. This still isn't grape season. You still can't get new wine in mid-ish July. This poses a big problem. And this is what I'm leading you into now. That if this comes and goes, and this is the beginning of our 50-day count, remember what I said? Either summer in Luke 21 is a literal understanding for us to know that the season and time is going to be just before summer, or it was just an analogy. That's the word I was looking for. Or it's just an analogy for us to know that like summer, when you see these things, that's when it's going to start. Okay? And then... Now what we're going into is saying, well, what about the reasoning why Zechariah is all about that fifth and seventh month? Why is Ezra all about the fifth and seventh month? Why is, is Jeremiah so much about it? Why does Daniel say, as Jeremiah? Why does Second Chronicles say just the same story? That's why Cyrus is there. Why does Daniel 10? give us in the third year of Cyrus. You see that? What about Daniel chapter 10, which we have taught on many times, in the third year Cyrus king of Persia? Do you know what the third year of Cyrus represents to us that we've revealed in the Revelation? in his third year is about two and a half years in to the tribulation. What happens at the point when his two and a half years, do you remember what happens? Okay, there's the two and a half years and then what happens in verse 20? Then he said, knowest thou therefore I come, uh, wherefore I come unto thee and now will I return to fight the prince of Persia, okay, in the spiritual realm, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. Who is this prince of Grisha? Well, you guys remember what it means? It could also mean of a place in Arabia. This is one of our reasons in leaning to the Antichrist being MBS, okay? But when is this happening? In the two and a, in the third year, which is about two and a half years after tribulation has started, man, I got an ant here. He just won't go away. Come on, you little bugger. You would think I'm cru I'd crush him, but I'm not gonna get him all over my fingers. Poor little ant doesn't have much longer to live, anyways. So, the we know that this is connected in the typology to about two and a half years into seals when the Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months, okay? We've taught on this, we know it, we understand it. Well, guess what? The typology is Cyrus. Why would we have the typology of Cyrus? Why would Daniel chapter 9 say that he understood the 70 years? You see that? In verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years, wherefore, whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Well, what was the story of Jeremiah the prophet in the desolations of Jerusalem? Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus also. Remember? Then Cyrus comes on the scene, right? We've talked about that. We'll share on that when we get to that point a bit more. 
you see, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. <laughs> I always like this. Then you come down here in verse 24 and it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And people say, it's a multiple of this times that and, and seven times the seven of 49 of this many years. No, how about you go read verse two? 70 years on the desolations of Jerusalem. <laughs> I love it. You see, yes, there was an is to the count to Christ and so forth. But the entirety, the, the real bulk of that revelation is all about the prophetic is to come. Daniel is prophetic. It is for the end. But you see, my point here is it's connected. He's talking about Jeremiah. He's talking about Cyrus. Okay, it's in all of these books. So if it's, on all, if it's in all of these books, how on earth can we get to wine? How on earth can we get to new wine by starting all the way back in April? Even doing seven Sabbaths and then doing account for Pentecost. You still don't even get to new wine. You still don't get to new wine. Look at this. Here's some fun things on new wine. Look at that. August to October. So it goes late August to early October is always that time frame of the new wine season. Okay? You'll find it everywhere. Here's a, a write-up from an ancient, uh, 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 from this book through Brill. Watch this. Uh, the grape harvest, even in modern Israel, occurs in the fall sometime between August and September. Okay? August, September. It's late August to early October. So the main bulk of it is September. You see this everywhere. It's in all sorts of things. Look at this. Harvesting grapes, uh, wine grapes. Uh, da -da -da -da. In addition to determining the time of the harvest, wine grapes, da -da -da, the harvest season typically falls between August and and October. August and October. Everywhere. August to October. You don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be any calendar whiz. It's when is it ready? Check this out. As I was doing research on this, I found this, this festival that takes place and has been happening for 600 years, brothers and sisters. I can't say, but the, the Worcester Market, which is called the Sausage Market, which is kind of funny because it's actually a wine festival. In the spa town of Bad Durkham is the world's biggest wine festival. It is held annually on the second and third weekend of September. So for 600 years, I think except for COVID years, for 600 years, it's been happening between the second and third week of September. You, you see a pattern that's going on here? Late August to the beginning of October. Year after year after year after year for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Yet, all of our 50-day counts brought us anywhere from here to here. Hmm really leaves you scratching your head, right? There, there, there's none that are harvested in July. They're late August to early October. I want you guys to understand why I'm doing this. It's because Taurus is either the beginning or it's the beginning. <laughs> Does that help? <laughs> okay, so... Watch what happens when we do this count and we look at this like the beginning of creation. So what was this like? Well, we go back to Genesis chapter 1. Those of you who have been around for a while know this. In the beginning, God created. That means in Jesus, the Father created. Okay? That means Jesus created all of it. He created it all. But it was the father, it was the father had the plans, the father's idea. And he said, son, what's mine is yours. Go and create it all. It's all yours to create. Okay. How do you know that? Because the word beginning 
is first fruits, 7225 of the Hebrew word, which is the feast of first fruits. Okay? The one without leaven. Jesus is the first of the first fruits, you see? Jesus is the first. Remember what that is? Exodus 34, 26. Watch this. Exodus 34, 26. The first of the first fruits. Look at that. You see, there it is. Hebrews 72, 25 of the first fruits, 1061. This is the feast of first fruits, the 16th day of the first month. This is the first fruits of the feast of weeks. And what is it? You see, this is the one from the first fruits of the feast of weeks. Okay. Now, watch this. If the Lord God is taking everything back to the beginning, then you know what it seems like? It seems like this. We have one of two options. You see, in Moses' day, if he was looking at the constellations and Taurus was the beginning, okay? We know Taurus was the beginning, okay? We know Taurus was the beginning. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. When the Lord God in Exodus chapter 12, one, uh, verse 2, said, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first of uh, the first month of the year to you. Okay? Look at the word beginning. Everybody says rush, right? Which means what? The head. Well, how about that? The head. The head, the chiefest, the beginning of the year. What, what does that mean? Well, it means one, it means the beginning. If, if Moses was here and Moses was looking up at the sky and looked to the constellations at night to understand what the Lord God told him in Exodus chapter 12, Moses would be looking at one for the first month of the first, the beginning of the year, he would be looking for Taurus. Because when the Lord God told that to Moses, <clears throat> the beginning of the year was in Taurus. So if Moses was here today, he was resurrected and he was looking up in the sky, he would be looking to Taurus to start his year. The problem is for us is that Taurus has now moved to the third month. And that's all because of the sun. You see, the hour and the minute hand are the sun and the moon. The minute moves faster, like doing a rotation, right? And the hour is like the sun that's moving slower. But it's like there's either a, a good battery or a bad battery in it, right? And it moves too fast or it moves too slow. That's kind of what's happened. The sun has moved up and now made Taurus the third month, and now you've got spring over here. So the, the issue is, again, this brings us to the entire conversation of everything being two options. How can you work the first month being Nissan where it is today as month one, and yet Taurus being the third month and still begin to count there and land on harvest seasons. Are you following what I'm saying? If this is where Nissan is now, and this is where Savan Taurus is now, yet when he told Moses where Taurus is now was over here, how, how can we reconcile this? How, what are we to look to? That's even a better wording. What are we going to look to? Are we to look to the sun, moon, and stars? Or are we to look to the harvest? Because when the Lord God told this to Moses, Moses understood it by looking at the sun, moon, and stars. Prior to this, what do you think everybody did? Prior to receiving any law or any understanding, what did they do? they would have been looking to the sun, moon, and stars. How could there have been a writing? It was in the fifth month or the seventh month or the first month. All of them were related unto this time to Taurus. 
But do you know what else it was related to? Check this out. Some people will say, well, we, we don't relate it to a Beeb. There, there's no such thing as a Beeb. And I try to make the story or, or the point that why would the 14thers who learned from Polycarp, right? They learned from Polycarp and Polycarp who learned from the Apostle John and they stood and were willing to go to the death for the understanding that that Nisan started and the 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 full moon or Passover was on the 14th day of that first month. Why would they be willing to go to their graves and, and be executed? And they were a typology of Smyrna. Why, why would they have been willing to do that? Remember, original true Christians were 14thers, standing on the truth of the 14th day. What would be the point of doing that if there wasn't an understanding that they had? You see? So let's see how we know. You see, so he says, this is the beginning of your month, the beginning of your year. And he says, now on the 10th day of this month, right? And then goes to the 14th day. Well, watch this. You go back to Exodus chapter 9. Here's all the plagues, right? You have all the plagues except the final one, which is the plague of the firstborn. That's what's happening in chapter 12. Which means you're probably looking at these events in, uh, of the plagues happened in the beginning of the year. Okay? They probably happened, these plagues, at least the latter portion of them, if not all of them, happened at the, from the beginning of Nisan. You want to know how we can know this? Listen to this. It's right here. Exodus 9, 31 and 32. And the flax and the barley was smitten. You see, they were struck. The flax and the barley was smitten. For the barley was in the ear and the flax was boiled. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. So the barley was struck and the barley was in the ear. Okay? It was still, it was a tender green ear. Okay? Called a beeb. The green ears of corn. Is a green ear of corn. The, the complete ready time to harvest. No, of course not. But what is it? It's letting them know that the farmers would tell them that, yes, this is the beginning of the year and it's going to be ready for Passover time to take that, 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 that first fruits, that feast of first fruits sheaf of the wave offering. Oh, you're going to see what I mean. It's awesome. Okay? So the barley was struck. And why? Because the barley had grown up enough that it was a beeb and it had tender green ears. When you get to chapter 12, we see that it's the beginning of your months, the beginning of the year. Right? Shall be the first of your year. And we know it's the striking of the blood, the right, the 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 lamb, and the first ones are struck, and then they flee the 15th, 16th day of Nisan of the first month they're fleeing. This all happened in Taurus. This all happened in Taurus. But now Taurus isn't here anymore. It's here. So in our modern day and age, because of where the sun has moved, Nisan is now here, which is in Pisces. So how can you know when the year started? Well, it just told us. It just said that there were green ears of corn at the beginning of your months, at the beginning of your years. Hello? How could that be? It's literally right here. If it was the first month of the year, and it was the start of the year, then for barley, to have had green ears, which means still green and tender, right? Not full, not really ready to bring in, but still green and tender. That was the sign. That's why they bring in that sheaf of the wave offering. Do you realize that that barley sheaf that they bring in 
is still green in like 14, 15 days from then? When they declare the beginning of the year, when, when barley is seen being green in the ear, it doesn't mean that in 14 to 15 days, it's all going to be white and, 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 or golden and start taking it down. You see, what they had to do in the old days, because they didn't have combines, they had the big sickles. They still had to go out and do it by hand. They didn't wait till it was all completely dried up. They brought in the green ear of corn on the, 14, uh, uh, on the 16th to be waved while it was still a little green, while it was still wet. They didn't want it falling as you're going to see along the way. This is one of your evidences. And what do you see? <clears throat> We see a conversation of barley and of wheat. Why then wasn't the wheat struck? Uh, why wasn't the wheat struck? Well, the wheat was there, you see, but it wasn't smitten because it wasn't really grown up yet. Why? Because winter wheat takes longer to grow up than winter barley. Now, the question is, but how is barley already growing by Nissan 1? How does barley already have green ears coming out of the ground? So it's got to be a few inches high, right? Or several inches tall already. And it's already got to have buds of green, right? With the, the little ears grown out. How on earth is that possible when spring has just started? That is what baffled me for so, so long. And the answer that's going to help us is how do we compensate? How do we get from this to this? Because we just saw that from here all the way to in here, this is the time from in here to right here from the end of the sixth month to right in here, the beginning of the eighth month, remember, Tishri is the seventh, this is when wine is ready. How can you make that count from the 16th day, do seven Sabbaths, then 50 days, and end up here at the latest? Something's going on here. And you see, I've just shown it to you with all of these things with wine. With the wine, it is crystal clear that it's somewhere vast majority, the vast, vast majority is within the time we call September. See? So it's always in this portion of time in September is the core portion of time. Every single year. We cannot get to that count. You cannot get to new wine with a count that started Nissan in March going into April. Well, let me show you something else. You guys will remember this one. We haven't shared on this one for a while, right? What about Lamaste or Lamaste? What does it mean? Loaf mistake. What, what was the point of this? Well, guess what? For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they would bring loaves of bread made from new wheat crop. By the way, this new wheat doesn't mean the spring wheat, new wheat. It just means the new wheat that's been, that's been harvested. All right. So from this wheat crop, they would bring in loaves of bread into the church, making loaves of bread from grain collected. And look at when they bring it at the beginning of August. What? Well, let's have a look at this. In many parts of England, those of you who have been around for a while will remember this, but we're putting it all together. We're going in reverse. We're now going wine and seeing where wine truly is the new wine. Now we're going to look to see where, where the the loaves of bread right like the feast of weeks the feast of weeks the two loaves of wave bread 
Where are they? What on earth is going on? How come this is telling us August? How can we get to new wine so late? If, if it takes like a hundred days to get there, something isn't right. And so now as we go from new wine, now we're going to look for this feast of first fruits of the wheat harvest. And you're going to start to recognize something in a moment. In many parts of England, tenants were bound to present freshly harvested wheat to their landlords on or before the first day of August. In, Anglo -Saxon Chroni in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, where it is referred to frequently, it is called the Feast of First Fruits. Now, we know it's not called the Feast of First Fruits because that's unleavened bread. This is leavened bread, you see? It is the Feast of First Fruits of the wheat harvest, okay? Just like it said, wheat, not barley. The blessing, uh, the blessing of the first fruits was performed annually by both Eastern and Western churches on the 1st or the 6th of August, and the 6th being the latter feast of the transfiguration of Christ. Wait a second. Hold the phone. You're now telling me <coughs> that this time frame right here is really the time frame of new wine. And then <clears throat> you're saying that on or before the 1st of August, somewhere before or on, right around the 1st of August or before it, is when the wave loaves of bread of the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest were brought in, for hundreds and hundreds of years that it was give or take on or before august 1st what what are we missing what on earth is going on how how do we get to here how do we get to this being the time frame in here to being the Feast of Weeks, the seventh Sabbath, and the beginning of the 50-day count. How is that even possible? Well, what else did it say? Look what it said about, uh, um, and the latter being the, fest, the, the Feast of the Transfiguration of Christ. Well, hello. What do we know that if this is the seventh Sabbath, and this begins the, the, um, uh, the seven-day wedding, right? So we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then this would be the eighth day when he returns from the wedding. That's pretty close, isn't it? You see? That's pretty close, isn't it? To the 6th of August. They just said that on Lofmas Day, there was another one that it could even go to the 6th of August and that it would be the transfiguration of Christ as the celebration. What do we know about this transfiguration? When we go to Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, check this out. In, verse, in chapter 9, verse 7, first you have Herod the Tetrarch, and it was what? He was perplexed. He was perplexed just like the one from Luke 24. He was perplexed. You have this typology starting like this pre-trib happening, right? And then we see he has the meal, the 5,000, and look what happens. Remember this word company? Those that recline at a party meal? Do you remember that revelation connected to Luke 24? Those who will be invited to the upper room that are a part of this company? It was pretty crazy, right? So you've got this connection to being perplexed, like the pre-trib escape happened. You've got this connection to those sitting at the party meal that are invited guests that get to go, that were invited, that went to the lowest room and get to be called up to the higher room. And then what happens? We follow the story here and we get to the transfiguration in Luke 9, 28. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings 
What is this eighth day a reference to? We've taught on it so many times, right? What is this eighth day at the transfiguration? It's exactly what we've taught on. If this eighth of Av is the seventh Sabbath and you've got the seven day wedding and then him returning at the eighth day, this is our typology of him coming at about an eight days in the Luke transfiguration story. Pretty darn close, isn't it? From the third to the sixth. Pretty darn close, isn't it? Feast of ingathering, uh, uh, the, the, the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest when they observe it here. Pretty darn close, isn't it? How about when we do the 50 day count that starts here on the 9th of Av? Do you know where it ends? Right here. What would be the end of the 50th day? What would be this day? Pentecost. Pretty interesting, right in the midst of the time of new wheat. Pretty interesting, isn't it? How is it we get wine in its right time? We get the harvest of leavened bread being brought in at the time of what would be the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Both of these in their correct place, yet neither of them being a count that starts in the first month of Nisan, March into April. Yet, at the same time, yet at the same time, the declaration of Abib, because they were struck in their green ears in the first month, which means, are the green ears ready in our modern day and age at Nissan One? They were this year. They were this year. This was declared because Abib, Barley Abib, was in the fields, which means by the time of Passover, and when they would have to bring it in to wave it on the 16th, it was still going to be green. It was still going to be wet, but it was going to be ready, green and wet to bring in. So this really is in alignment with Exodus from Exodus 9 into Exodus 12. This really is Nisan this year. It really is connected to a bee. And the barley being a beeb, which still means green ears. And it is the green ears that are waved, that are cut down and waved of barley on the 16th of Nisan. But then we've got a problem with the count. How on earth can we repair or understand this count? Right? This, this is a big piece that's missing. Two of them. Wheat and wine. Have for hundreds of years observed in a place when they were actually ready. Yet, barley was a beeb way back here. And the sheaf of the abib barley was waved here. How on earth do you reconcile that? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. It's awesome. It's awesome. <clears throat> Watch this. Let's read this one. So sowing of barley was done in Israel during the month of Bull, which is October through November. Okay. Why is this important? For me, for me, it was a big deal because it never dawned on me that there was a winter barley as well. You see, I've often wondered, even when I knew of winter wheat, I thought the winter wheat was planted very late. It was covered, watered, whatever. And it, then snow would come or the cold and it would freeze down there and that would be it. And it wouldn't start to, to grow and start to break out of the ground till about Nissan, till about the first month, right? March, April. That's the way I thought it worked. 
So I could never understand for the life of me how green stems, roots, and, and it already growing several inches tall to have green ears on it, <clears throat> how on earth that could happen by March, April. It was always a head scratcher for me. It's not anymore. We're going to cover that as well. So look at this. <laughs> that stupid ant is still crawling around on the floor, sucker. So sowing of barley was done in Israel during the month of Bull, October to November. After the early rains had begun uh, to fall and the ground could be plowed, barley matures more rapidly than wheat. Okay. So it's winter barley and winter wheat, and there's a spring barley and there's a spring wheat, okay? There's a difference, and we're going to show some of these. And that was what we were talking about here in Exodus. That's what you know from Exodus 30, uh, 9, 31, and 32 is you can tell because the barley was struck, you see? The barley was struck, but the wheat wasn't because it wasn't at that point yet. It says, and the harvest began in early spring during the month of Nisan. Okay, commencing in the hot Jordan Valley and continuing into the higher, more temperate sections until it reached the highland plateau region E of the Jordan in the month of Ziph, which is April, May. Okay, what you're going to find out is that the barley harvest continues even a little bit later, you know, it goes May even into the time of early June. Okay, but what did we read? And what's the fact? that barley ripens faster than wheat, but they were both planted in the winter. You see? So by the time March, April comes, you already have barley that as soon as it reaches a certain temperature in, in the air, it really starts to shoot up quickly. And it's harvested from April, May, even maybe into the early part of June. That is, while barley is being harvested. You have to remember, they do start harvesting at the time of Passover. So you got the sheaf of the wave offering, and then they will start harvesting barley until late May to early June. You got to remember back in their day, they were using, right, the sickle. So they weren't waiting, waiting till everything was dried up and, and falling on the ground. They would start right away. And by the time it was corners and gleaning, then the stuff was dried. You see? They didn't have combines. They just couldn't go out and let it wait until it was all ready and, and done and then let the combines just shake everything out as it's going. Okay, so what do we have? What is a key piece in this to understand? Only barley has a sheaf brought in. Only barley has a sheaf brought in at the beginning of the harvest while it is still green. I want you to remember that. That is key to remember. Only barley has a sheaf brought in at the beginning of the harvest. Then the harvest continues till generally late May, early June. Do you know what doesn't have uh, a sheaf brought in? Do you know that you cannot make bread from green wheat? <laughs> it needs to be dried. It needs to be dried. But the sheaf, no. The sheaf, it turns out, has a term for it. This, this kind of wheat, while it's green being brought in, has a term for it that's going to blow your mind. But the first question to answer is, how on earth is wheat already sprouting and it's up several inches high that it's got green ears on it by the beginning of Nissan? It's because something I did not know about, and that is this word called tillage or tiller, okay? These tillers. I was searching high and low for this answer. I didn't know what the word was 
till this afternoon. You see, what needed to be understood is when wheat or, or when barley is planted, barley in particular in this case, when barley is planted in the fall, it has to be growing for about a month and a half before the winter comes. That's the part I didn't know. It's actually got to take root. It's got to grow. And it's got to get to a point where there are tillers growing from it. For wheat, for winter, sorry, for winter barley to survive the winter, it takes about a month and a half of it to be growing in late fall for it to have these things called tillers, these shoots growing off of it. It needs to have, I think, between four and six tillers growing off of it so that when the snow comes and covers it, it is hardy and it is strong and it is able to endure during the winter. So that when early spring comes, like March, and the ground is melting <coughs> right during the, say, during uh, uh, Central America and the U.S. into the Mediterranean, right? It's very similar in temperature on the coast into the Mediterranean and through that, that when that weather starts to come in very early spring, even just before spring, the barley starts to shoot up quickly. That was the mystery that I had never, ever understood. I always thought they were just simply planted. The seeds were put in the ground. They were covered. They were watered and bang, the snow would come. And then it wouldn't start growing until March time frame. It would start to break through, which always left me baffled saying, how on earth are you trying to tell me that as soon as the snow melts, they break out of the ground in like one week, they're like a foot and a half high? Like, what the heck is going on? I've never heard of this. It's because it's not true. They allow it to grow to a certain height with these tillers growing out of it so that it can endure, endure the winter. This is why. This is why. When they make the declaration here, as it was declared in um, uh, uh, Exodus 9, that the barley was smitten because it was green ears of corn. And then in 12, it says it was the first month of the first year or the beginning of their months and the beginning of their years. The answer is green ears of corn or, or green ears of barley. It was the green ears of barley. It's because it was planted last fall, allowed to grow to an extent of four to six tillers. Snow came, covered it. Snow melts off, it starts to stand up and shoots up within days. Very, very quickly starts to shoot up and gets these green ears of corn. And by the time these green ears are a little bit more ripe, they're not, they're not brown, they're not ready for like a, a full use harvest, they're still green, that on the 16th of Nisan, they're waving them while they're still green. They are still green when the waving is coming. Could you imagine waving the, the, white, the ripe barley and you're waving it as the wave offering and all the barley is flying off of it? <laughs> that, would be, that would be a little odd, wouldn't it? You would think it should still be held together. How is it held together? By still being wet. By still being wet. You see, barley harvest thus marked a defined time of year Right? In Ruth chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> what happened in Ruth 1, 22? Look at this, the last verse. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Remember, guys, Ruth is the picture of the Gentile bride. <clears throat> you've, you've never... I mean, if you've been around for a while, you may have heard me talk once or twice about Esther. I did a video on Esther, <clears throat> excuse me, once a long time ago. Why don't I really talk on her? Because she's not us. Esther is for the Jews, okay? 
She, she's the Jewish princess, everything else. It has nothing to do with us. Ours is Ruth. There are two women books in the Bible. One is Ruth, one is Esther. One is Gentile, one is Jew. Hello. You see? The answers we're looking for are found in Ruth. And so what happens? She came into the country at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay? Was she with her kinsman redeemer? No. Nope. Was she married to her kinsman redeemer? Heck no. He didn't even know who she was yet. <clears throat> so when did she come in? She came in somewhere around this time. She came in around the beginning of the barley harvest. See that? She came in around the beginning of the barley harvest. <clears throat> okay? Now we can understand that. We know there is no pre-trib connected to Nisan, Passover. Okay? That is the mid-trib rapture as we know, as we've taught on many times. So, what else can we know about this? <clears throat> there it is right here. See? With four to six tillers. When it comes to um, winter wheat, and when winter wheat is planted, excuse me, winter wheat only requires, I mean, it, it's far less than, um, than the uh, 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 barley. I think it's only got like one or two of these growth leaves that have come out of it, okay? <clears throat> excuse me, where barley is four to six. So there is a big, big difference. And that's why barley is ready so much faster at the beginning of the year. Look what else they called barley. Okay, look what else that they said about barley. Okay? It's, it was like Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, right? Uh, the first full sheaf of barley. <clears throat> Some people, you see, they also argue. See, watch this. Um, further, the, arm, the omer of barley needs to be one of two special states called Aviv and Carmel, okay? But what you're going to find is that there's been debates. I didn't know this until doing this study, that there have been debates that the barley for the wave of the sheaf offering is not to be um, green. They would say, no way, it's supposed to be green. It's supposed to be ripe. And so what they would say <coughs> is that it's not supposed to be waved, guess what, until the end of the harvest. You see? Some would say it's not just this, this waving, but it's, it's actually the dried barley itself being brought, and it wouldn't be waved until the end of the barley season. Interesting, right? Do I think that's the case? I don't. I believe this is the beginning and it's waved when it's green ears of corn in it. While it's still wet and has moisture in it is when it's being waved. And when you see why, you're going to understand. Okay? So the other thing you see is, as we were talking about, when we go to this back in Exodus, um, well, I guess anywhere, but in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, this shall be unto you the beginning of your months. Look at the word beginning, right? We spoke about this a moment ago. Rosh, the head, the beginning, the beginning of your years, the beginning, the chiefest. Out of all the constellations on earth, what's the only constellation that's a head? Taurus, the bull. It's represented by the bull, by the head of Taurus, and it's called, even in the Hebrew alphabet, it's called the beginning. You see, we've shared on this many times. See that the constellation of Taurus was the sacred bull associated with the renewal of life in the spring. When the spring equinox entered Taurus, the constellation would become, uh, da, 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 where was it? Um, to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in the zodiac, consequently represented by the first letter of the alphabet. This, why do you think they did it? Because of this. It was Taurus. But you see, it's still all bringing us back to say, but, 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 how do we account for it being here now and not here in Taurus, but it's now over here in Pisces? How can we adjust for this, this count? Something still has to be 
understood in this. Watch this. There's something called barley silage. <clears throat> and as you go and you study into all the barley and the harvesting that I've been doing, and the wheat one in the spring compared to winter in, in both cases and all of these things and, and the grape harvest and everything, you find this term called silage. Are you ready for this? Watch what barley silage is, guys. Making barley silage is the process of, listen to this, taking green, wet, whole plant barley. What is taking green, wet, whole plant, green ears of corn, barley? That, my friends, is what is waved on the 16th day of Nisan as the sheaf of the wave offering of the first fruits of the feast of first fruits. It is wet, green, whole plant barley. Are you ready for this? And processing it in such a way, listen to this, listen to this, that it can be stored for future use in the livestock operation. Let me just pause there. I'm going to take a sip of coffee and just read that for yourselves and think about it. <laughs> does, uh, does the story sound familiar to some of you guys? You have green, wet, ears of, corn, uh, ears of barley, the full plant, like the sheaf offering, off, uh, sheaf of the wave offering, that can be used for future use in livestock. Are you kidding me? Remember when we said in the beginning how, how having eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to receive? Man, it's not only applicable in, in events in life and in seeing things happen in our lives and, and in movies and in videos and all these things. It's everywhere. It's even in the harvests. Does this sound familiar? Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Let's go to Exodus. Uh, let's start in 29 so you guys get the context. Okay? What do we know about the story? Jacob sees Rachel. He says, ah, Rachel is so beautiful. No problem. I will work seven years for Rachel. In Genesis 29, 20, Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. Remember, those are the first seven easy years that we're in the midst of coming to an end to right now. It, they flew by like days. They really were seven years. They really were the mystery of the beginning of Genesis of 7,000 years. But they flew by like days. And then what? When her days were fulfilled, or when he fulfilled his seven years, his father-in-law made him a feast. And then he goes in onto her and he comes out, wakes up in the morning and realizes that he's been duped. He says, why have you done this to me? Why have you beguiled me? And he says, look, I'll give you the younger, or sorry, it's not right for me to give you the younger before the firstborn. You see, that's the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat. But then it says, um, fulfill her week. Okay, so go do that wedding week. And then you're going to still serve me seven more years. But I'm going to give you Rachel. I'll give you Rachel, but you still have to serve seven years. Okay? And then what? So you've got the seven easy years, which represent the seven years we've been going through for the last seven years. Okay? That we're coming to an end to. And then you have the seven years of seals, which represent the other seven years that he did for Rachel. But then what happened? Well, then he worked six more years you see guys i was leading you in that story in the beginning also to lead you to this so watch this <clears throat> we know this story right he worked 20 years so in genesis 31 41 he says i have been 20 years in thy house 
I served you 14. That was the seven easy, okay? The seven easy, not seals. <clears throat> they were the first seven easy years. Then he worked seven years to get Rachel. So the first easy seven that flew by quickly, that's what we're coming to right now. He's expecting Rachel and he gets Leah. Leah is the firstborn. Hello, first fruits, firstborn. Okay, the Gentile bride, the one that he didn't want, but yes, he loves us, but it really wasn't the one that he wanted, right? He wanted Rachel. So then what happens? After those first seven, bang, that's the escape of the preacher and bride of Christ. Then he puts in another seven, the second seven of the 14, and bang, he's fulfilled his time for Rachel. And then what does he do? Then he works six more years for the cattle. Then he works six more years for the cattle. What do these six years represent? You guys know it. We've shared it many times over the years. They represent the six years of trumpets before the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. When he returns feet down, Zechariah 14 destroys all the enemies, all the battle, everything that takes place, and Satan is bound, and then bang, their jubilee year, they will all return the resurrection of those that were promised in the resurrection, and they'll have their millennial reign promise. And you see, what is it? In the big picture, it's the seven easy, it's the seven next that he fulfilled for Rachel, it's the six for the cattle, and at the end of those 20 years, which is at the end of 20 to the start the 21st, what does he do? He makes a covenant with his father-in-law. What happens at the end of the 13 years of total tribulation? The covenant is renewed like Daniel 9, 27 that we were sharing earlier. And then when that final year is over, it's the final jubilee. So check this out. When does he serve for the cattle? The six years of trumpets. He's serving for the cattle in the six years of trumpets. Do you realize that when the Lord completes his 40 days, that this is the light portion, right? Mark is the light. Who does Mark represent? Mark is representing the light. Mark is representing the creation of days. This is the group who Jesus comes to save. Jesus is coming to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this is the last straw for them. This is the end of the, the, the house of Israel, the Gentile time where the Gentiles are grafted in. This represents the world. This represents the house of Israel. The Gentiles grafted into it. This is to the end of seals. Okay? When seals are done, bang, seals are done. He does what he does in that seventh year. And then what happens to start trumpets? They're going to start the rebuilding, right? The two witnesses, right? Zerubbabel, Joshua, Yeshua. They're going to start the rebuilding of the city and streets. The 144,000 are there. Messiah, high priest and king, right? The Melchizedek is there. Who else is there? The house of Judah is there. Who, whose discourse, whose gospel are we in when we get to the flesh portion of Matthew? The Jews portion. The Jews portion. Doesn't, doesn't Jesus have to do something again, right, in relation to, yes, the 144, but during the portion of those that had been blinded? Isn't he have to do something? Doesn't Christ come to complete his work? Isn't there another about three and a half years him coming to complete the other three and a half years that he did the first time he came? This time he's coming to complete his work and he's doing it during whose time? Matthew's time. What time have we referenced that as in this storyline for years now? It represents the cattle. The first seven is represented by Leah. The second seven is represented by Rachel, which is the seals. and. The final six to the covenant being renewed is the cattle that is represented by Judah. What did it say that the barley silage 
which is the green wet ears of corn could be used for in the future for the livestock shut up shut up seriously i told you guys this is amazing i had never ever heard of this before. i never even heard this term before i don't even have a clue what it was until this afternoon the wet green whole barley branches brought to the sheaf of the wave offering is a type of silage that can be used for the future for cattle. And we've been teaching here for five years that that cattle representation is the portion of Judah. And here he was coming to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when they're done, there will be a future time when he comes for the cattle portion. Awesome. So awesome. Okay. So now we can see this connection to, yes, it was green ears of corn. We can see it now from Exodus. We can see it from harvest fields. We can see it from when Ruth came into the land. We can understand that it was green ears of corn even at the wave offering because it's also something that could be then used for a future time. For cattle. So I have no doubt that this is the true sheaf of the wave offering time of the barley in the green ears of corn. So what else can we, can we take, can we glean and begin to understand from all of this? What, what more is there? Well, let's go to Ruth chapter 2. We know this in Ruth chapter 2 in verse 10, right? She's there. It says, when she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes? You see, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. We've talked on this many times, right? Being the stranger, the term stranger, it just, it's a word for Gentile. Okay, let's go to Ruth chapter 2. And it's just a, it's another word for Gentile. So let's go to it right here. See, it means adulteress as well. Foreigner, you see? Adulteress. Does that mean she was an adulteress? No. It's a term for Gentiles. What is she doing? Well, she arrived at the time of barley. She arrived at the beginning of barley harvest. She sees him and she's like, wow, she fell on her face, bowed herself to the ground. Sound like something you might be doing when you're before the Lord, your kinsman redeemer. Why have you found grace? Why have I found grace in your eyes, seeing that I'm just some stranger, some Gentile, right? Romans 9, because we've been grafted in, guys. We've been grafted in. Let's keep going. Let's see in verse 12. The Lord, so now this is Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, right, to be. Listen to what it says in starting in verse 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me, all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not there, uh, here, heretofore. The Lord, Father, right, recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come. Kind of sounds almost like even the time, right? Maybe even the worker bride portion is a connection here. The recompense for the work has been given. A full reward has been given to you by the God of Israel. Listen to this. Verse 14, it even sounds like the meal that the disciples might be having, right? Verse 14, and Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, 
Come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat uh, beside the reapers, and reaped her parched corn, and she ate, and was satisfied, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Verse 17, So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So here we still have its barley, right? We come down to verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite said, And he gave unto me also that thou shalt keep fat, uh, fast by my young men until, I have ended, until they have ended all my harvest. Okay? Until they have ended all the harvest. We come down to verse 23, the last verse of Ruth 2. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now we've got this question. Well, wait a second. Are we looking to something to the end of the barley and the end of the wheat? Are you realizing something? Hopefully it's slowly coming in. You see that? This was the beginning. But barley didn't end until late May, early June. Wheat was still a little bit longer, and wheat wasn't ready for about another month and a half. It was, it was give or take a month, two months or so after the barley was done. It doesn't mean that, that wheat wasn't already growing. It was already growing. There was like an overlap. By the time the barley harvest comes to an end, they're already starting to reap the wheat harvest. And then the wheat, har the wheat harvest comes to an end in later July. It could be, some might say even, it depends on, on the climate, obviously. Some might even say in June, mid, late June, into early August. Well, how about that, right? Let's have a look at that. Look at this. So here's one for uh, America, just as an example. July to September, July to September, July to August, July to August, July to September, July to uh, August. Uh, June to August, July to August, June to August, okay? All in this, the lower you get, it'll be a little bit more. See, May to July, uh, June to July, June to July. You see, there's very few May down in here. The bulk of all of this part going through this mid portion, this Mediterranean type portion, what do you have? You have this June to August. June to August. It's everywhere. June to August is the bulk of when the wheat starts and when the wheat ends. Are you starting to get it? Are you realizing that what happens is that the bread of the first fruits of the wheat harvest is not brought in at the beginning of the wheat harvest like the barley is. The first fruits of wheat of the wheat harvest is brought in at the end of the wheat harvest, at the end of the winter wheat harvest. Do you realize the only one that went in first was the first fruits sheaf wave offering? Do you want to know how this can be proved out? And again, this was winter wheat, by the way. Okay, this is winter wheat dates. Not spring wheat, this is winter wheat. It's all 
July to August. July to August. To the end of winter wheat in this range here. And it just so happens that they say shortly before to no later than August 1st is when they bring in leaven loaved of breads to church for hundreds of years? Do you know the only way you can understand this count? The only way to discern it is when you understand that the sheaf of the wave offering is when the barley was still green. Yes, they started to harvest it, but it was the beginning. It was the beginning of the barley harvest. Did you see what it said about Ruth? That she gleaned until the end of the barley and of the wheat harvest. And of the wheat harvest. Do you know that the wheat harvest does not end until about here? Do you know from this point here, there's only 50 days that remain to get to the second to the third week of September, which is new wine and it's 50 days later? Are you starting to hear what I'm saying? Look at this. How about this one? Uh, da, 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 da. I think it was here. I don't know why it's not highlighted anymore. Winter wheat is planted in the fall and harvested in the spring summer. You see? Spring going into summer. While spring wheat is planted in the spring and harvested late summer, early fall. Um, I think there were other ones. I don't know where that highlight just went. But you see this in everything. We are talking about spring, uh, 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 sorry, winter barley and winter wheat. These are things that we have been talking about forever here in this channel in relation to winter wheat. Now we realize barley is the stuff that's also planted in winter, which is the only way you can get the, 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 the sheaf of the wave offering that is still green ears to be ready in late March, early April. But the only way you can get to the wave loaves offering of the Feast of Weeks is not if you go from the beginning of its harvest, but at the end. Do you follow that? But at the end. And do you want to know what the evidence of it is going to be? Let me show you what this evidence is going to be. Okay? There's your sheaf of the wave offering. That brought our seven Sabbaths to the eighth of Savan. If the debated part is one week later, well, then it was here. If the sun and the moon are in the place where they're supposed to be and they lined up as well as they did this year like they did, and there was green ears of corn and it was ready like it was professed it was, and it was declared by more than one witness, there's Renewed Moon website you can go see for it, that it was declared, well, then it's right here or it's right here. All right? It's right here or it's right here. These two dates have passed. We're giving it another 10 days because of the possibility of the moon. But there really isn't a way to understand it unless you knew the moon was off by 10 days. If every harvest and every festival is connected to the moon, uh, why would this be the true date and not be at the moon? And this be the true date, yet not connected to the moon? You see? I am still hopeful, but you have to understand something. This is the time of the end of the barley harvest. This must then be the time recognized as what? The start of the wheat? The beginning of the wheat harvest? 
do you realize that if there's no pre-trib that happens here, okay, sure, you can give it that additional week. But if there is no pre-trib that happens here, the evidence of the loaf day when new wheat that is brought in, you see, new wheat that is green, you're not making bread out of it. There has to be the harvest. It has to be dried. It has to, you know, it has to be uh, malleted and so forth. It has to be prepared to be made as bread. And for hundreds of years, they were doing it at the time frame connected to right here. The only way we can get to this count is knowing that this is the beginning of barley and this is the end of wheat. And then this is the end of the grapes. Are you seeing what I'm saying? It has to be that um, barley was counted from the beginning of its harvest, whereas wheat and grapes are counted from the end of their harvest. Is it made up? Nope. We have hundreds of years of historical evidence. Is, is the wine made up? Nope. We've got hundreds of years of historical evidence. The only way we can get to it is if we understand that the first fruits of the wheat harvest don't go at the beginning. The, the bread cannot be ready when it's still green. The, the grapes can't produce uh, 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 um, wine when they haven't even really started budding. They have to go to the end of their harvest. The only way to understand that and to get there is if we take this, because th before I get there, I want to remind you that right here, if the first fruits of the wheat harvest is at the beginning of the harvest, just as it was with the barley, then this is going to be the pre-trib escape day. If we pass these days and we'll grant the following week, but if we pass this time, then the first fruits of the wheat harvest are the what? Are the breads baked with leaven that will not happen until they've been dried at the end of the harvest. I want you to understand that. In fact, we're probably already past the, pos the final possibility. But I'm granting it because we do have evidence of 10 days. We do have evidence of the circuit of the sun. But I want you to understand that if the escape doesn't happen here, then it's because it's connected to the end of the wheat harvest, not the beginning. How on earth can we get to this? How on earth can it go from here and yet be able to make this count that takes us to the end of seven Sabbaths, that takes us then to the end of 50 days, how is it possible? The only way, in my opinion, that it's possible is this right here. Yes, the sun is right here now at Nisan. But the Lord God has never changed. What's been fulfilled? Barley has already been fulfilled. You see, if the escape were to happen, <clears throat> if the escape still happens here, then do you know what I would say everybody was pre-trib? Like I was saying at the beginning, I would say then it's probably uh, feasible that all of those who were taken pre-trib were actually 
the, 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 the barley harvest, the main harvest of the barley. I would be willing to submit and say that the barley harvest, the main harvest, if the escape happens here next week, in the true 70th year, then they were barley. And that the first fruits <clears throat> of the Feast of Weeks of those who will be the remnant workers would be the first fruits of the wheat. That specific group. They're not part of the bigger, they're part of this group remaining to work. Now, I'm not saying that is what it is. I'm saying I'd be willing to submit that it could be that they equaled the main barley harvest. Now, in the past, I've taught, and I still believe it's true, I'm just saying I would be willing to accept that here, but we would find out for sure anyways. I believe that the barley was already fulfilled at, of course, his resurrection and those who came out of the grave. Okay? However, this could be the equivalent of the end of the barley harvest and would be that portion going in the pre-trib, that spirit, excuse me, that spirit portion. And then he's got his remnant worker portion, first fruits of wheat, okay? But if it doesn't happen here, if it still doesn't happen here, then we are absolutely not barley main harvest. If it turns out the count takes us to this as the seventh Sabbath and this the beginning of the 50 days, then the pre-trib bride is indeed the spring, uh, sorry, the winter wheat, first fruits of the wheat harvest. We can understand this now from the harvest. You see, what's the only way we can get there? It would mean the end of the end of the uh, uh, um, barley harvest and the start of the wheat harvest, the winter wheat harvest. Spring wheat harvest comes to an end. Winter, sorry, spring barley harvest comes to an end, and oh my goodness, I I'm still mixing it up. You know what I'm saying. Winter barley comes to an end. And winter wheat count will then have already commenced. That would mean this is this is where it's building to in this understanding, in this revelation. You see, we are what? Co-heirs with Christ. You see, we are joint heirs, co-heirs with Christ. Christ was in Taurus the beginning. You following? It was in Taurus. So either this is representing the escape, and it was starting in Taurus, and it was the same day, and it equals... Genesis 1 1, or it's the beginning of the wheat count, the winter wheat count, and it gives us what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths, and the 50th day starting. You following? Meaning, it still does begin in Taurus. But it's not the beginning of the 50 days, we'll see. But it's the beginning of the seven Sabbath count of the Feast of Weeks. How on earth does this make sense? Taurus, Taurus, 16th day. Taurus, 16th day is the revelation. 
So Taurus 16th day is the revelation. So we go to Genesis 1. We're seeing in the beginning, we know this was the 16th day in Taurus. If the Lord God is bringing everything back, so as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Then it would be Taurus 16th day. That means Savan 16th day. But the, the harvests are still over here. How do you account for that? As Christ was the first fruits of the winter barley harvest, so shall the winter wheat harvest people be. But that doesn't mean that's when they go, unless we're 10 days off. It means this is the beginning of their count for what? The Feast of Weeks, as it was in the beginning. If he is the first fruits and we are of the first fruits, we are co-heirs with Christ. He's co-heirs. It was Torah's 16th day. Now Torah's 16th day is in the third month then the beginning of Taurus may not be that the 50 days will begin in Taurus with the pre-trib escape, but that the count for the Feast of Weeks will begin in Taurus. Still equaling the beginning to the Lord God. Yet still at the same time, being the third month in our modern day and age, and what he's counting from, is the beginning of the seven Sabbaths, which is the count of the Feast of Weeks to the first fruits of the wheat harvest. How, how do we prove this out? <clears throat> how do we continue to, to show this out? How is this even possible? We've shared it on many occasions, right? Well, now you're going to see something that makes you say, well, wait, is it still maybe in Savant? You see, you get to Ruth chapter 3, verse 2, and it says, Behold, it says, And now is not Boaz of our kindred with uh, whose maidens thou was? Behold, he winnoweth, okay, barley tonight in the threshing floor. Well, the question is, is when is he, when is he winnowing this barley? When is he winnowing this barley in the threshing floor? Is, is he winnowing this barley um, at the end of the wheat harvest? <coughs> Excuse me. It doesn't really make sense that, that he's winnowing it at the end of the wheat harvest, which is maybe another month or two away by the time it's all done. <coughs> and he's winnowing barley. You see, what's he doing winnowing barley? Right? She says... Her mother-in-law tells her to go and to sit of his feet, right? Why hast thou show me this kindness, right? Uh, in the latter end, in the beginning, blessed are thou, daughter. Um, you are the kinsman redeemer, the nearest two. So what did we see? He still hasn't married her yet. It, it still hasn't been a, a completed thing yet. So... Is, is, it, is it still barley? Is it at the end of the wheat harvest? Because at the end of chapter 2, she was to stay till the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. Well, they never ended at the same time. Yet here in Ruth 3.15, it's still all about barley. <clears throat> and it says, also he said, bring the veil. <laughs> bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley. You know, I don't want you to go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed, right? Bring her the barley. And she goes on and says, I hear are the six measures of barley. He said not to go home empty-handed. Ruth 3, 18. Then said she, sit still, my daughter, um, until thou know how the matter will fall for the man will not rest until he have finished the thing this day. 
six measures of barley in her veil. You know what this gives me hope for, right? This gives me hope that we're still in this range. He was winnowing barley, which means it was at the end of the barley harvest. He gives her her veil filled with barley. Why on earth would it be wheat when at the end of chapter 2 it said she was there until the end of barley and wheat? But yet here it's still barley and she's being given a bag of barley. Well, as we've come to understand here from this difference in winter barley and winter wheat, this is the latest end for the end of the barley harvest to be complete. And this is the time of the um, uh, winter wheat to start harvesting. So we're either that, that pre-trib group is either going to be that ephah and that barley ephah or the bride is going to be the first fruits of the wheat harvest representing the two loaves of bread. You see, why, why am I going so far down this? Why am I really beating on this and, and showing this count? <clears throat> this is where he's, he's talking. He won't let that day rest, right? Um... Uh, what was it? Verse, listen to this. <clears throat> in Ruth chapter four, verse two. So, you know, he's got to go to these other kinsmen, right? These other elders, not kinsmen, but these other elders and see who would have her. Listen to this. In verse two, it says, then he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. Isn't that interesting? Don't we know of 10 when all this is about to begin that there's 10? What 10 are there? Not the 10 that belong to Ishmael that are going to bring the attack on Jerusalem. There are what? There are 10 apostles at the start of the 50 days, aren't there? There's 10 apostles in John chapter 20 at the start of the 50 days. <clears throat> it's like he's sitting with them and says, hey, which one of you, hey, elders? Remember the elders around the throne? 24 of them, right? 12 and 12 represents the tribes and the apostles. But when John 20 starts, the beginning of the 50 days, there are what? There were 10. And they are referenced as elders. And what does it say? It's all about who's going to redeem her. And they're like, hey, I don't, I don't want to lose mine. If I redeem her, if I take her as wife, I'm going to lose my stuff. You see? It's like the apostles, they've got their job to do too. Then it says in verse five, then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Well, isn't that funny? Don't we know a group from a portion of the bride that remains who will be part of the resurrection of the dead for their portion of their inheritance? To rule and reign with Christ? Verse 6, the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. You see, it has to be a group that has an inheritance, <clears throat> like the apostles, of which they were 10 at the 50-day count beginning. Okay? And then we know the story in, in the way it was in ancient Israel that they had to pluck off the shoe and give it to the neighbor and it was the testimony in Israel at the time, right? So Boaz draws off his shoe and in verse 9 it said, and Boaz said unto the elders. So this is like Jesus saying unto the apostles and to all the people, listen to this, you are witnesses this day. What one group of people is called a witness in the Gospels. Well, in particular, Luke, uh, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. 
the Smyrna group. The remnant bride, right? Those that remain to work. He calls them his witnesses. So you have the 10 who are his elders represented like John 20, the apostles, right? Because he's the kinsman redeemer. So it's like when he goes to the elders who are the apostles and there were 10 there. And then he's saying to those people who were there, well, who are the rest of them? Who does Jesus also meet with at the very beginning of the 50 days before the escape? He meets with those who he's going to call his witnesses. They're the Luke 24 disciples. Who he, remember in Luke 12, he meets with them. He's going to let them know right before it happens. And that when he returns, he's going to eat with them. So he's telling the apostles who we know he also meets with on the 50 day, at the start of the 50 days. So you've got the 10 represented. You've got the witnesses of Luke, the disciples represented. Verse 10, it goes on to say, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. You see? Who does he purchase? The Gentile bride. What does he do by this purchase? Doesn't he provoke to jealousy? Does he not provoke to jealousy? Isn't that what he said the purpose of him allowing the Jews to fall so that he can turn to the Gentiles, that he could provoke them to jealousy? Every single one of these things connected to the starting time frame of the 50 days. The question is, <laughs> are they barley because of the ephah of barley? Or is she actually going to the end of the wheat harvest? That'll be the question. And you see, this is why I'm telling you, Taurus is the beginning or the beginning. There have only always been two options. It either starts it or it starts it. There, it's, it, it's either the start of the 50 days or it's the count that brings us to the end of the seventh Sabbath and starting the 50 days. It's only one of the two. The problem is we don't get any more clarity even though it said she was there till the end of the wheat harvest. Yet you go to the third chapter and in the third chapter, it's, it, it's her taking an ephah of barley. The good news with that is, is the ephah of barley, you can't have that whole thing of barley until he's what? Winnowing it and he's there on the threshing floor, which is at the end of the barley season. And then we come into all of this and we see the 10 like the, like the apostles. We see the witnesses like the disciples. We see that he's purchased to make them to provoke to jealousy. What is this provoke to jealousy all about? Well, you'll remember this in Zechariah chapter 1. Look at this provoke to jealousy. Okay? Da -da 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 -da. Um, let's start in verse 12. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah? against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years. You see, we know this revelation. We've known it for years, which means when this all begins, when this all starts, we know it is going to begin in Taurus. But is it going to begin in Taurus as the Lord God's Feast of Weeks or is it the count in Taurus being the beginning of this count? So to the Lord God, guess what? It will be to the Lord God the start of the year, which is Taurus, 16th day of Taurus, right? The 15th to the 16th, which is the 14th to the 15th with the 10 days because of the moon. So to the Lord God, this is going to be the beginning. But guess what? To the Jews... Zechariah chapter 1 verse 12 says these 70 years, which means to the Jews, it's still the 70th year when this all happens. What about this part with jealousy? Well, look at this. Zechariah chapter 1 in verse 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. You see, because what? They're, they're still on the other side of Jerusalem, right? For I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction. They helped forward. I am jealous. Now in his jealousy, what is he going to do? He's going to use his Gentile bride in this purchase redeemed possession bride to provoke them to the final point of jealousy. This is this, this provoking to jealousy that we've read in Romans that people and pastors have spoken about for generations. The, the main hub bulk of this revelation of provoking to jealousy is the pre-trib escape. Is the pre-trib Gentile bride vanishing is the ultimate provocation of jealousy. And this provocation of jealousy, he says, will happen in these 70 years, which means it'll still be to the Jews the 70th year. You see, we've gone to Zechariah chapter 8 many times. And in Zechariah chapter 8, listen to this in verse 2 and verse 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth and the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain. This is the beginning of trumpets, as you all know, right? This is when he says, let your hands be strong. You're going to build on the foundation that was laid during seals. Now the temple's going to start. And what does he tell them in verse 10? For before these days, there was no man, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. When does he set all men, everyone against his neighbor? It's everywhere, guys. It's what we were talking about at the beginning. See, this is when he's going to make them jealous by taking out the Gentile bride. Then they're going to be in bewilderment, in amazement, seeing what's happening on the earth. And they're going to be planning to make what? War against each other, nation against nation, city against people, neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom. What did it say? Because of the affliction for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. This is the red horse rider when that starts. When, when was this time frame? Well, it starts when he was jealous. By the start of trumpets, he's no longer jealous. He doesn't need to provoke them to jealousy anymore. What was his greatest provocation of jealousy? The purchased possession of his Gentile bride. And in Zechariah 1, it said it was happening while well, it was still the 70th year of them being in the land. You see? Which means it still has to be happening at some point in the 70th year. Well, guess what? If this was really the Feast of Weeks to the Lord God and the count began, well, something's missing. If this 10 days later is really the Feast of Weeks to the Lord God, then get ready to go. But if not, then something's missing. Is it because we're not in the 70th year? Is it because God isn't really beginning everything from Taurus like he revealed to us through the Holy Ghost? No. It will begin in Taurus. And it will be at the end of the wheat harvest. But guess what? To the Jews, it'll still be the 70th. How on earth can it still be the 70th? Well, you guys know for yourselves that the Jews don't change their year until Tishri 1. The new year for Jews for the house of Judah 
is Tishri 1. You guys know it. Something we've taught on many times, right? Many, many times. Let me show you that, that piece of it. We mentioned it earlier. You see this biblical chronology, this ability to, when, when you go in and count the kings and from the, count, the, the, the counting of the house of Judah kings to the count of the house of uh, Israel kings, there, there's always a discrepancy of a year that goes on one side or the other. And there was something that was discovered in, I think, the late 80s and I think, again, even earlier in that as well. And what it was, was um, right here. There was a, a method that was discovered in the, in the scriptures that they termed the accession year method and the non-accession year method. Okay, under the accession year method, if a king died in the middle of a year, the period to the end of that year is called the accession year of the new king whose year one would begin at the new year. So what that means is if a king of Judah died somewhere, for example, back in May, in the second month of Ayar, okay? And the new king took power at that point. He's new king, but he would not officially be sworn in to start his first year until Tishri won, okay? That's the way it works. But that is called the non-accession year, okay? Or sorry, sorry, died in the middle of the year, period of that year, it would be called a session year, meaning it would only be the accession. So whatever that period is, until the new year starts, it's only the accession. It's his accession year of the new king, whose year would begin, okay, in this case, at Tishri 1. Under the non-accession year method, the period of the end of the year of the new king uh, uh, would be year one, and year two would begin the start of the year. So to the house of Israel, let's say a king died in November, and it was Kislev. From that month of the previous year, all the way to Nisan 1, all of those months, or two months, or three months, maybe it happened in February. And he took over in Shabbat. Well, by the time he gets to Nisan 1, they would have called in the house of Israel, they would have called that one year already passed. Even though it was 10 months or one month, they would say that was his first year. <clears throat> and at Nisan 1, they would say, now he's starting his second year. Okay, that's the house of Israel in the non accession. The house of Judah would say whatever one month or 10 months before Tishri, that was just your accession time, and we're going to start your year one on Tishri one. That's very important to understand, because who is in Israel right now? Judah. It is the house of Judah who is in Israel right now. You see, and it was Judah who did non-accession, and it was the house of, or sorry, it was Judah who did accession, and it was Israel's kings who did non-accession. Why does this matter still to us now? Why does it matter? Well, if you remember counting of Leviticus, when we do the count to Leviticus, what does that mean? Remember when they came into the land, we did the, the, they had to establish first in 1949. So if you do 1949 and you count four years, right? Let's go to the chart real quick. You go to 1949, where is it? There we go. We go to 1949. So from 48 to 49 was they're getting their affairs in order, okay? The king of Judah, right, who was uh, um, uh, Ben-Gurion, 
never came officially into power, right? When he when he ripped up the provisional government in March of 1949. So they had planted the trees, they voted, and then he was officially in office. People say, well, that's when it started. Others will say, no, it was 1948. No. Who's, who's the king? Was he king over the house of Israel or is he king over the house of Judah? He's king over the house of Judah. So the Lord God, who starts from Taurus to the Jews, theirs is from Tishri, which means 1949 Tishri was the official start of that king. Do you know why? Because they're Judah that are in the land. And when Ben-Gurion took power and became the official leader in March of 1949, it didn't begin at Nisan 1. For them, being the house of Judah, it would have been the accession. Do you get it? It would have been the accession until Tishri of 1949. Meaning from Tishri of 1949, the year one, which is the fifth year from when they came in, right? They, they had to establish. And then from Tishri of 1949, so from Tishri of 1949, Tishri of 1950, Tishri to Tishri, <clears throat> Tishri to Tishri, Tishri to Tishri. So from Tishri 1 of 1953 to Tishri 1 of 1954 to the house of Judah is year one. Tishri of 1953 to Tishri of 1954 is the complete year one of them being in the land. To the Lord God, it's from Taurus to Taurus. Okay? It's the count, it's going to be counted from the beginning in Taurus. When we do this and you get to 70, we get to what? Well, we call this to the Lord God, his 70 being from feast of weeks to feast of weeks, but to Judah, it would be from Tishri 1 to Tishri 1, which means the 70 years of Judah in the land does not end until Tishri 1 of 2023. Judah in the land, official 70 years for them, does not end until right here. Now you say, well, why is that important? Well, again, something we discovered in studies that was revealed about three or so years ago, now coming back to the forefront. And why does it have an application? Well, something that we've been teaching on for almost five years. In Zechariah chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 5 and 7. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those, past tense, you see? Chapter 1 was, was present tense. Chapter 7 is past tense. Even those 70 years, did you at all fast unto me? So when you were in the land and you fasted for those 70 years, remember, who's Zechariah written to? The house of Judah. Where does the house of Judah count from? Tishri. Where does the house of Judah still count from? Tishri. See that? That's the changeover of their year right there. 5784. It changes over on Tishri 1. Why do they still count like that? Because they're Judah. Hello. Then what does it say in verse 7? Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in posterity uh, in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south of the plain guys this is all past tense saying for the 70 years when you were in the land and you were in prosperity and you were inhabiting it and everything was doing well 
In those 70 years, did you at all fast and mourn unto me in the fifth and the seventh month? What's the point of telling us the fifth and the seventh month? Do you know there's a, a fasting as well in the, in the fourth month and in the tenth month? Do you know there's, there's a bunch of other things that could have been brought up? Yet it says those 70, and in chapter 1 it says these 70. You know the south of the plain, um, Negeb? I went and looked this up. You see this, the south of the plain called Negeb? This is actually the southern portion, like it says, the southern district of, Jude, of Judah. If you go look on any, um, on any map of Israel, it'll show you that that southern portion of Judah, right under Jerusalem and further down as it goes down, that whole portion is called the Negev. Did they get the Negev in 1967 at the Six-Day War? No. They already had it in 1948 when they first came into the land. Why, why do I mention that? Because the 70th year is either this year or it's after 14 years from now. Hello. You see, if the scriptures tell us that they were in Jerusalem, and remember, they did have Jerusalem when they first went in. They didn't have all of it, but there was battles. And then, of course, it wasn't until 67 that they took control of both sides. But when they came into the land in 1948 and had to do all these things to get established, they still, they still were in Jerusalem. But more than that, it also tells us the south of the plain, which means the Negev. They had the Negev, just as they were also in Jerusalem in 1948 which tells me we don't have to wait till this 70th year about this being occupying in the prophetic understanding in the south of the plain because they actually had it not here but they had it from when they first came into the land the negev is sudden uh, uh, southern jerusalem and the reason i'm saying it is because it gives reassurance that this is the 70th year. But what's the point of the fifth and the seventh month? What's the point of having the fifth and the seventh month with a past tense saying those 70 years? When we know the prophetic revelation of those 70 years are the 70 that we were revealed in the count through Leviticus 19 when they came into the land. Why is it that Zechariah is written to Judah? And when we come to it, and we've been speaking about it for five years, that this connection to the fifth and the seventh month is important to those 70 years compared to these 70 years, him being jealous for Jerusalem and the way he would provoke them to jealousy is by taking out the Gentile bride that he has already paid the redemption price for. How could it be that wine, new wine, isn't ready till about mid-September and bread loaves were brought in for the first fruits of the wheat harvest late July to early August, yet the count that we get brings us into Savan by going from Nisan, when Nisan is truly, in fact, there. The only way to understand it is that she was told she would be here till the end of the barley and the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest does not end across the world, across this zone around the world, the wheat harvest does not end until latest July in this range right here. And we're talking right here, the seventh Sabbath. Do you understand why I'm showing you these things? 
Do you understand that in all of this, everybody knows what the ninth of Av is, right? The ninth of Av is about when all of these destructions have happened to the Jews. Not only the temple, but when they were kicked out of Spain. All of these things throughout history is connected to the ninth of Av, which is their fasting and mourning in the fifth month. And it's related to what? Look at this. It's related to a connection to the fast of Gedalia. Was it the fast of Gedalia? No, this has to do with the destruction of the Jews, an attack coming against the Jews. When does this attack happen? The ninth of Av. So if this is, in fact, the true seventh Sabbath, to the end of the wheat harvest, and this is the beginning of the 50 days. What do we know happens? One attack happens, as we have been teaching forever. One attack happens at the beginning of 50 days. And the attack by Syria comes at the end of 50 days to Tishri 1. What's the difference? 50 days. 50 days. And we have scripture that told us those 70 years to a 50 day period of the fifth and the seventh month from one attack that connected to a second attack. The one attack was a ninth of Av, and the other one is the attack that's connected to Gedalia. It's the fast of Gedalia. And they celebrate or observe this fast of Gedalia on the third day of Tishri. They observe it right here. Why do they observe it here? Because it can happen during a feast day, which is the Feast of Trumpets. But when did it actually happen? On the first of Tishri. To the Jews, what is this day now start? What is this? This is the beginning of the year. This is the end of their 70, and this is the beginning of their year. What did Zechariah chapter 1 say? What was Zechariah chapter 1? These 70 years. So the Lord is jealous, affliction is, is coming upon them. But he said it would happen in these 70 years and guess what happens the first attack is coming connected to the ninth of av which is the beginning of the 50 days the escape and the 50 days begin with something we've been teaching forever the first attack in northern israel the light affliction followed by the end of 50 days the anointing of the holy ghost acts 2.0 and Syria coming and attacking them, which is what we've been saying for how long? It begins the Red Horse Rider, which is what? The start of the 14 years. Which to the Jews is what? The start of the year. Meaning this, this attack, these events will have happened while it was still the 70th year in Jerusalem. This ninth of Av attack and this fast of Gedalia, first of Tishri attack is all over scripture. It's everywhere. The fast of Gedalia falls on the day after Rosh Hashanah, the third of Tishri. It was established by the sages to commemorate the assassination of Gedalia sometime after the destruction of the first temple. In fact, he was murdered on Rosh Hashanah. You see? He was killed on the first of Tishri, which would be the beginning of the 14 years, which would be the second attack that brings the destruction and scatters them. You see? But they observe it then because of uh, it being Tishri, right? The Feast of Trumpets. What else? The rule of Gedalia lasted, according to tra tradition, only two months. 
You see, it wasn't actually two months. It was about a month and a half or so. He was there for about what? Six weeks? That's why you have Zechariah telling us in the fifth and seventh month, those 70 years. To the Jews, the fifth and the seventh month are what? From, from the fast of the fifth month to the last day of the year in the fast of the seventh month is what? To them, it's the end of the year. On, on the Gregor, I mean, on the, on the God's calendar, Nisan is the beginning of the year. It's the house of Israel. To the house of Judah, Tishri is the beginning of the year. So you have the fifth and the seventh, meaning the end of their seventh. You're still in their seventieth in the fifth month, and the attack happens right as their new year is starting, and it would be to them the start of the seventy-first year. That would be the beginning of the fourteen years. What is it? Ninth of Av to the fast of Gedalia. His it, it, it was to the first. It was that Gedalia's rule was only about six weeks. And we see it everywhere. Remember this in 2 Chronicles? Who was the one? It was Jeremiah. <coughs> it was Jeremiah the prophet. During the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the sword coming against them. Right? A destruction comes against them. And then what happens to them that escaped the sword carried away into Babylon? And it says in, in uh, 2 Chronicles, what was it, 36, 21. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, right? Because they've been defiling the land. For as long as it lay desolate, she kept her Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, there's the king of Cyrus. You have Jeremiah, you have Cyrus. You have the fulfilling of 70 years and you have Cyrus that's going to make the proclamation to allow them to go back and rebuild. We know during the seven years of seals, they're only going to rebuild the temple, we, uh, uh, the, the, the foundation. We know during um, Cyrus's reign, they only built the foundation. We can go to Jeremiah 41 and you have the story of the seventh month, which is the start of Tishri, when Ishmael came with his 10 men, you see? What's the typology of, right? The 10 kings, the, the end time, bad guys, 10 kings. And what do they do? They come with them and they killed Gedaliah. When did they kill Gedaliah? You got it. The start of the 14 years. Who does Ishmael represent? Ishmael represents Ishmael even with Abraham. And it was what? When Abraham was 86 years old. When Abraham was 86 years old, he has Ishmael. 13 years later, when Abraham's 99 and Ishmael is 13, God makes a covenant. And then when Abraham is 100, the promise comes, the promise is born 14 years later. And of course, it says that Ishmael was 14 years old. Ishmael comes at the beginning. Ishmael is the typology at the beginning of the 14 years, comes and kills Gedaliah, whoever this modern day Gedaliah will be, that will come after uh, um, uh, uh, the, who's in office now is removed. Who's he going to be removed by? That first attack is probably going to bring about that devastation. That Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon type with Iran. We've talked about this before. There's going to be more than one Babylon. The first one will be the representation of Iran. That will be the first light affliction in northern Israel. Where, where is this story? Now we see it in Jeremiah. We saw it in Second Chronicles. We see it in Jeremiah. We showed it in Daniel. How about Ezra? The entire story of Ezra is about this story. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Jeremiah, the proclamation allowed him to go and rebuild. We know in this entire process, they only built the foundation. Just like what will happen in seals. This is what we were saying earlier in Daniel 9. Jeremiah, 
This 70 years, I understood by the words of Jeremiah. And here he is in chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus. You see, the reason I bring these things up, look at this. What was this? Uh, second or first chron uh, second Chronicles 24. At the end of the year, this end of the year isn't the circuit of the sun. It's a, it's a representation of a period of time, not the sun one. So what is this representation of a period of time when Syria comes with a small army and destroys the larger Jerusalem army? This is at the year's end. What year's end is it to the Jews? The exact same representation of the year's end as when Ishmael came. This is what I'm telling you. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. We've talked about it so many times. So many times. It's something that with Zechariah, as I finish this up, we have talked about this so often in years past. It's about to come into fruition, in my opinion. I believe we're finally getting this revelation of understanding that here we are in the 70th year and we have an exact 50-day count from the 9th of Av to the end of Elul. We have a count that brings us to the middle of September which all over the world represents when new wine is ready. And the end of 50 days of Acts 2.0 and the anointing happens and we know the attack then follows and it begins the 14 years and it's Syria. And we were told that Syria will attack with a small army, will destroy Jerusalem, they'll be fleed and, and removed from the land and that it starts at the year's end. So year's end, start of the year. We know it's the red horse rider. In that 50 days earlier, he provoked them by taking out a Gentile bride who was using as the Gentiles to provoke his people. And that this 50 days earlier is precisely the end of the winter wheat harvest when two loaves of bread, when wheat leavened bread is brought into the church. And it represents the first attack of Israel and 50 days later is the second attack. And we've got scripture that tells us in the fifth and the seventh month, those 70 years, which means it's still in their 70th year until Tishri 1. You follow what I'm saying? It's either going to start in Savan or it's starting in Savan. To the Lord God, Savan, Taurus, is the beginning of the year to the Lord God. In the beginning, it was the 16th day of the month of Taurus. If it is to be understood this time with the winter wheat, the 16th day of the first fruits of the wheat harvest count would then begin as Christ began on the 16th day of the first month of Taurus, as he was the feast of first fruits, our count will begin on the 16th day of Taurus, now the third month, will begin the seven Sabbaths count, followed by the 50-day count with attack one, with attack one at wave leavened wheat loaves brought in, having provoked them to jealousy in still their 
70th year as a session for Judah. They will have their first light affliction in northern Israel. The Lord would return on the eighth day, and lo and behold, I was saving the best for last. The seventh day is the great day of love that they talk about for weddings. And this would be the eighth day when the Lord returns from the wedding and his 40 days begin. His 40 days end. There are three days to the anointing of the Holy Ghost and a literal attack at the year's end by Syria, exactly the fifth and seventh month, these 70 years, and those 70 years when he goes in the past tense at the end of seals, directly related to scripture in half a dozen different books. Brothers and sisters, we may need to hold on just a little bit longer. We may have, give or take, five, six weeks left. Don't let that upset you. Don't let that get you down. Think of it like this. The seven Sabbaths count have begun. The seven Sabbaths count have begun. And by the time I'm done this video, Sabbath one is being observed. Brothers and sisters, this was a lot. I hope you got it. If you need to, rewind it and watch it. It is the revelation of understanding the timing of the harvests, seeing the difference between barley to wheat, to when the sheaf compared to the end of the harvests are done, to when the new grapes are finished. It is directly, absolutely perfectly in line with the fifth and the seventh month and directly related to Syria. It is directly related to history past and with uh, the ninth of Av and the first of Tishri. And the only way all of this can happen is if this is the 70th year revealed and understood as it has been declared. Hold on tight, brothers and sisters. I'm not going anywhere. I will be here with you. We will be in the forum. For anybody that doesn't know what the forum is, if you want to join us in the forum at Ministry Revealed, you can go to the website, ministryrevealed.com. You can click on the menu, go to the forum. It takes a few seconds to sign up and it's free of charge. 11, 1200 people from all over the world sharing news, events, prayer requests, uh, Bible studies, all sorts of things in there. Come and join us and we will continue to strengthen and lift up and pray for and watch and diligently seek the word until this time comes. Brothers and sisters, we are here. It is absolutely the 70th year. We just need to be patient for the Lord God's perfect timing. It may be a week or it may be another five past that. This is the 70th year. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.